Great. So um, this is the talk that's the ever-evolving uh, talk that I guess I first did in 2013, something like that, with some other people, and it's been just evolving to a different thing. Uh, but as always, the, the GitHub source is there. If you see the GitHub link on the screen right now, um, that's where the source code of this whole thing is. So, um, And what it includes that you might want to play with is uh, a bunch of Python scripts that we're going to run through. Uh, I'm able to run through them in an interactive way because there's no way I can type live type the way Dave Beasley does. So I have like a tool <laughs> do it for me. Uh, but you can actually download the whole thing and, and, and run through the scripts. And if I go too fast, which is likely, because we usually want to get to the ORM stuff at the end. And, you know, so if, you know, when I go too fast or something, just go download the stuff, take a look at it and play with it. Um, so the, the, uh, the 1.4 inning, uh, as I'm trying to stress that the new thing is SQL Alchemy 2.0, but you'll notice that that's not what's currently released. We have this thing called 1.4, and 1.4 is basically this giant transitional thing uh, for 2.0, so that it runs cross-compatibly with 1.3 for the most part, and we'll get people onto the new 2.0 style. Uh, and it's going I think it's a lot better, so we'll, we'll see a little bit of how that, that looks. So... Um, what I'm going to do here is reload this whole page so that the bullets come out. Okay, starting out. So this is just the, the top level boilerplate stuff and you can just sleep through it. SQL Alchemy is all about building uh, Python structures that represent SQL database concepts in a very direct way. Um, so when you start out, it's pretty essential to know some SQL um, or you'll write angry tweets. Uh, you know, I look at Twitter and you see a lot of beginner programmers who don't know SQL. They should learn SQL first uh, because my stuff is not going to make sense if you don't know SQL. It's going to be too much to learn. So what SQL is good to know for this tutorial? Just a little bit, mostly, not not really much. Um, the main, main thing is you know what a table and a column is, which I'm sure just about everyone here probably does. Uh, create table statement, just the general what that does. The select statement, uh, it's pretty hard to not be aware of that. Uh, the basic idea of insert, update, delete. Um, the general idea of a database transaction, you know, that there's kind of a begin and then you do some stuff and then you can either commit it or roll it back. And I think that's pretty intuitive at that level. And then there'll be, there'll be some stuff that does with joins and some subqueries and aliases and common table expressions. Um, and that's the part where we don't, we, I'm just showing you some examples and it may or may not make sense if you're new to stuff, whatever. Presenting SQL Alchemy, database toolkit for Python. <laughs> introduced, I, I've always been said introduced 2005, but the actual first release was Feb 2006. So I guess I've been lying. It wasn't 2005. <laughs> I think I first talked about, I first wrote like a blog post in 2005, and that was where people were talking about it and whatever. Uh, single system for all things Python relational databases. And we're at 1.4.2 which is considered to be transitional for SQL Alchemy 2.0. Philosophies of SQL Alchemy uh, updated. Um, bring the usage of different databases and adapters to a Python interface as consistent and cross-compatible between different kinds of databases as possible, but still expose the distinct behaviors and features of all those different databases. Uh, SQL and relational database concepts are not hidden. They're very explicit. Um, usually when people talk about the word abstraction, they say, well, you should hide the database for me. Um, I don't know if we should use the term abstraction. If it confuses people, I use the term automation. Uh, so, which means that you know, you know about SQL and you're writing things that represent SQL and you know the database, you know that you're executing statements, but you don't have to do every little thing, almost like an IDE kind of helps you do things that you know what you're doing, but I, you know, but the IDE helps you do it. SQL Alchemy gives you Python structures to automate having to write lots and lots of insert statements and lots of selects or building up a select. Um, but you're going to know there's a database there. And the more you know the database there, the better it'll be. Uh, this is the old and still current diagram. Uh, we call this a pancake diagram because it's kind of horizontal stuff. Um, so the first half of the talk is going to be about SQL Alchemy core. And then the second half is about the ORM. Uh, the core stuff, uh, there's also a color coding thing going on here, which is not important to know, but it's interesting. 
uh, the green, yellow, blue, and red, if you can see color, uh, are gonna be a little bit thematic. Um, so anyway, uh, the ORM builds on top of the core and then the core uh, has all the, the nuts and bolts that talk to the Python database API. And that's the thing that actually talks to the database. So the driver, the DV has the driver. We'll show you that later. I shouldn't waste time on that part. Uh, things in the core, main top level things. Technology in the core gives you this thing called an engine, a database uh, connectivity gateway, which gives you these two components called the connection and the result. Uh, the result is, an, is a new object in 1.4. The engine maintains behind the scenes two components called the dialect and the connection pool. And um, then outside of the dialect connection pool and the engine stuff, you interact with it using uh, SQL expression language constructs, which will we'll do all that. And the SQL expression language constructs themselves build upon this system called the schema and type API, which we will do that too. Um, that's the core. And then quickly, before we get to it again later, the ORM. The o so now you have the core that's entirely there. Then the ORM is totally on top of the ORM, uh, of the core. The ORM maps a user-defined object model to database tables. Uh, and when you map your defined object model to these tables, it persists and updates the state of your objects in Python. Uh, to the database using a pattern called a uh, unit of work. The uh, ORM provides an extended version of the core expression language that supports uh, queries in terms of the object model. Uh, another thing the ORM spends a lot of work doing is uh, getting your database rows from the database to come back as your objects, which is a big deal. It's actually not a simple problem when you have these large graphs of objects that are all connected to each other. Um, and then it also, like most ORMs, provides a way to have objects that are related to each other. Uh, like if one object has a collection to some other objects, that would be based on a foreign key in your database. So that's like relationship. In SQL, I mean, we call those relationships, like one to many, many to one. You actually can have an ORM that doesn't do that stuff, but most of them do. Um, and then as you're working with your objects, it's going to synchronize the state of the objects with the state of the database data in an ongoing transaction which really means it's doing that unit of work thing and the converting the rows back and forth kind of in a semi-transparent way, depending on how you configure things. So that's the top level stuff that most people who have dealt with SQL Alchemy kind of already know. Uh, the shift to 2.0 is a new, all new rethink of many of the core APIs of SQL Alchemy. Two general areas of emphasis. One is fully removing the old patterns that have discouraged, been discouraged against for many years. Um, you can deprecate things and you can tell people to not use things and you can take things out of the docs. But when you've been around for 15 years, there's endless tutorials still doing it the ancient old way. And then people are complaining <laughs> that SQL Alchemy is hard because they read some old tutorials. So the only way to solve this is to take those APIs out completely and then people will know, please stop reading tutorials from 2007. <laughs> Problem solved. Um, and then the other thing that 2.0 is something I've wanted to do for years, uh, making the experience of core and ORM APIs much more similar and cross-compatible. Uh, the way the SQL Alchemy ORM kind of, kind of became what it is right now in 1.3 was kind of accidental and kind of evolutionary and kind of not totally figured out ahead of time. So now I am hopefully have made it much more consistent and makes sense. Like, why is there a query and a select? Doesn't really actually make any sense. Um, and there's a new emphasis, on, an, a new emphasis on explicitness and non-ambiguity. What is happening? Oh my God! What is everybody okay? <laughs> okay, I think some mute action just happened. Okay, so a uh, new <laughs> emphasis on explicitness and non-ambiguity, and that actually was largely inspired by the fact that people are Python has now is typing with uh, PEP44 and MyPy, uh, there was that. And then also we had a lot of issues where people were like, well, this does this this time and then it does this in this other context. And I wanna be able to write code that expects something consistent. And like, you're right. Um, so we did a lot of that and it makes things a little more verbose here and there, but it seems like I think people are ready to have a little more verbosity because it's gonna be explicit and clear what's happening as opposed to magic, <laughs> which everyone knows is terrible. 
Um, other changes, Python 3 only, which we should have been Python 3 only by now. It's Python 2 is extremely not well widely used. Uh, and async IO is in. You can use it. You can use SQL Alchemy with async IO now. And it works pretty well. And yep, thumbs up. And uh, there's we're doing basically the next what I'm going to do for the next year is get the MyPy PEP44 thing working. Uh, there's a MyPy plugin in 1.4 now. Uh, and it the, the, it covers a small amount of things, but it seems to work pretty well uh, so far. So it's kind of usable-ish. You know, people have reported some bugs, but they haven't reported too many bugs. So it seems to kind of work for some things. And, and I want to get the type stubs totally fleshed out. Um, SQL Alchemy 1.4, the transition. Excuse me. So 1.4 implements the 2.0 architecture and feature set as planned so far completely. Um, and it provides cross compatibility with SQL Alchemy 1.3. And it still works in Python 2. So in this talk, we're going to pretend that 1.3 and everything never existed. We're going to present SQL Alchemy completely from the 2.0 style. So everything that we work with here is, is the, new, the new way of working. And that will be different for people who've used SQL Alchemy, and it, it'll look different. You'll see it. What are the major changes, um, which you're going to see anyway, but here's the, base, the, the big ones. Uh, Python 3 only. Um, the engine has been scaled way back to not have 25 ways to do something. Uh, emulated auto commit is removed, which people might not even know it was there. It, it would automatically commit certain kinds of statements when used in a certain way. That's just gone. Um, Connectionless execution is removed. Uh, there's no more statement.execute. You have to do, be like, you. if you're going to run statements in your database, you have to say connect or begin. You definitely have to say to the engine, I want to connect now. Here's your unit of connectivity called the connection. The result set is way, way better. We'll see the things the result set does. It's pretty awesome. Uh, and the vast majority of SQL compilation is now cached. Uh, which was not the case before. We had this kind of experimental thing called a baked query that kind of did the caching and it was hard to use. Uh, it was experimental. And now we have an entirely new way to do the caching that was way more work to get it going, <laughs> but now it's awesome. <laughs> um, and the ORM query object is unified with the select state, the select object. So now you can use the select object, <coughs> excuse me, to get ORM results. So you can just, if you can, you have a select object for core. <coughs> Here comes the coffee. Select object for core and a select object for ORM. And then also when you get results back in the ORM or in core, you get the same result object that has rows. So you can say result.all, result, .all, result uh, returns tuple-like rows. Um, there's many options for how to change what you get back, but you will get the same kind of results. So if you have SQL statements, you could just run them against connection or against the session, get the same kind of thing everywhere. There's no, there hopefully are no surprises what you get back. It should be very consistent. And this also helps a whole lot with the MyPy thing because in Python, methods that return 25 different kinds of data don't work very well with typing. So uh, it's been largely inspired by having the typing system to be you know, straightforward. And the uh, async IO is there using a recently discovered approach to bridge async and sync APIs. Uh, so this is the SQL Alchemy onion. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure if there's actually a term called an onion diagram. Uh, it's kind of like the layers, you know? So the innermost layer is, is where we start for this talk and uh, you add more layers. I guess, you, I guess an onion, you're supposed to peel the layers off. So whatever, you get it. <laughs> you see the same green, green, blue, yellow, red color. So SQL Alchemy, I'm gonna, I'll move the little box here. Boom. SQL Alchemy can be understood most fundamentally working from the inside out. So the green onions are the engine, you know, the connection. And we'll start with that. Uh, the engine has to work with this thing called the Python DB API, which is what most of the databases, is what we use to talk to most databases. With async IO, it's not quite the same story, but generally the DB API is that PEP in Python, PEP 249. It's the de facto system for the Python database interfaces. Um, there's lots of them. Most databases have several. Um, they're very, very uh, inconsistent in what they do. The, the two, PEP 249 is a really, really, excuse me, open-ended 
you know, loosey goosey kind of pep. Uh, what the DB API looks like if you use Psycho PG2, which is probably the most DB API ish DB API. Uh, there's the two objects you deal with are the connection and the cursor. Uh, so the connection is takes some kind of uh, the connect function takes some kind of parameters like authentication and host name possibly. You get a connection. You want to work with SQL. You have to make a cursor first. The cursor is the way that you send uh, SQL statements and parameters. And then the cursor, once you've executed some statements, you get uh, fetch methods to fetch ro rows back. And then once you're done with that, you say commit or rollback up on the connection again. Uh, the connection has implicitly started a transaction for us. And that's kind of the big thing about DB API that so many issues are based on people understanding or not understanding is the, the transactional thing. Important facts about DB APIs. They have a lot of inconsistencies. Uh, you can't write an application that's going to target more than one database trivially. You have to write library code that's going to change how things work for different databases. Uh, when we work with SQL databases, we really want to deal with uh, bound parameters a lot. The DB API decided there should be six formats, which is ridiculous, in my opinion. <laughs> um, let me move the box. They're going to spend a lot of time moving the box. DB API has a very specific way of doing transactions. See, it's very loose about everything else, but transactions, we do it this way, which is that a transaction has begun implicitly. There's no begin method. When you start sending SQL over the DB API, the transaction has begun, whatever that means. Uh, but then nothing gets pushed to the database unless you say connection.commit. Uh, and it gets rolled back if you say connection.rollback. So there's no begin method. Now, some DPI, API APIs do have begin methods for set special things like if you want to begin with certain kinds of isolation levels or if you want to begin like a, a two-phase transaction. But generally, it's not part of the spec and you don't need to call it by default. Um, and then you can turn off the implicit transactions using auto commit mode, which every DP API that we support directly has now. Uh, when we first did this, auto commit was not a thing. So SQL Alchemy made its own auto commit, but now we took it out because they do it for us and they do it much better actually because they're the driver. SQL Alchemy um, provides a facade over the DP API using this thing called the engine. Uh, when you connect, uh, there's this consistent URL format to connect to databases. It's no longer like different kinds of parameters sent to this DB API connect method. It provides consistency in the following areas, transaction control, uh, accommodating, uh, getting new primary keys when you insert rows or getting defaults back, uh, triggered update defaults. Um, a wide range of data translation issues, like a really, really wide range of how data is translated. <laughs> Between Python, the, every single driver is completely different and has every driver, without exception, has a lot of things we have to do to get the data <laughs> to be consistent <laughs> back and forth. Um, driver specific quirks, parameters, all kinds of silly things, methods you got to call for some and not others. Mm. We provide a single bound parameter format for when you are using textual queries, which is actually the exception. Uh, using, using textual queries is the exception rather than the rule. Uh, partial cross compatibility for exception hierarchies. Uh, you can catch integrity error and it'll be the same integrity error um, on, on all the different drivers. Uh, but what the message is, is inside the exception might be different. You might have to parse that if you're, if you're trying to catch that kind of exception. So with that, we're ready. When you see this gray bar, that means we're ready to do the first uh, scripted thing. So I changed the window. If anybody wants to jump in with questions or anything, so far. Yeah. Nick, it's really hard to hear you. I don't know if your mic, yeah. maybe something on your microphone. Hmm. Let me see the chat room. Chat, okay. You could type in the chat if you want. I have the chat open. You see that big black box on your screen. Yeah. I also <laughs> pasted the link to the tutorial code into the Slack channel. So if anyone missed it on the first slide, it's, it's in the Slack channel. All right. Do you want me to move on? Will person who's asking the question can type it or? OK. So now we're in a Python interpreter here. 
um, which will run those Python scripts in a very controlled, so I can basically step through them. Um, but this is a this is a REPL, so I can type code, but I have a Dell XPS laptop with tiny keys, and I'm realizing that my fingers are too big for the keys. So <laughs> typing is not going to be <laughs> good. Um, anyway, when you want to make your engine, uh, everyone who's used SQL for 10 seconds knows this. The first thing you do is you do from SQL Alchemy import create engine, and then you make this object called an engine. Um, and what we're doing here, because we're in 1.4, which is the, we're in the middle of the 1.4 inning of 2.0, just to make sure it knows we want the full 2.0 experience, we send this flag called future equals true, uh, which will give us the newer transactional stuff, uh, which is cool. Uh, and it means that some other things that will work on the engine in 1.3 will not work on an engine that has future equals true. It's actually, uh, let me see if this even shows you, type engine. It's called a SQL Alchemy future engine. So it's actually a subclass of the regular engine from the future. Uh, so we made a, an engine with a URL, with a SQLite uh, URL. And this is the relative path uh, sum.db. So it's a SQLite database file called sum.db. Uh, and nothing actually has happened yet at all. All we did was make this object called an engine with a URL. Uh, it loaded up some modules. It hasn't connected to anything at all because the engine is what we call lazily connecting. It doesn't do the connect until you tell it to. Um, so when you connect, now it actually did something. Now it actually opened up the SQLite database. This is where, with people that know SQLite, it creates the, the file upon the first time you talk to a certain database file, it creates it. This is where that would have happened. So now the sum DB exists. Uh, and when you look at the connection, you could see because we're in future mode, it's also a future, it's a connection from the future. So now we have this object called a connection and that's not a SQLite connection, that's a SQL alchemy connection that is uh, proxying inside of it, deeply inside because you have to go connection dot connection dot connection <laughs> to get it. <laughs> the real SQLite connection is in there, uh, but you don't deal with it uh, you get that. I see a question in the thing from the person who was asking. Uh, my question was about drivers. Are there better drivers to for 2.0? Um, good question. Uh, we have not changed our driver recommendation. We've added new drivers because of async IO. So when you want to use async IO, you need to use an async compatible driver. Um, the two drivers for async IO that we support at the moment are async PG, which is a very good driver, and a AIO MySQL which is an okay driver. It's a port of PyMySQL for async. Uh, and pretty soon we're gonna also have AIO SQLite working. Uh, SQLite is not actually able to do blocking, non-blocking IO, but people want the async interface over SQLite. Uh, so we will do that. Um, for, so for Postgres, uh, still uh, PsychoPG2 is the driver for uh, MySQL. MySQL client is still the driver uh, or PyMySQL for Oracle. CX Oracle is the only game in town for SQL Server is still PyODBC, so it's pretty much the same. Uh, we have a lot more uh, data on the site about what database versions we support. Uh, we have a lot of version compatibility stuff. So I would just say, check out the website. Uh, drivers haven't changed much except for async IO. Um, back to the connection. Um, when you have this thing called a connection, you can call, the main thing you want to do with it is execute queries. When you want to execute a query, um, you send it some kind of object representing your query. Um, and because we haven't done the SQL expression language yet, I will illustrate the most fundamental kind of query, which is the text query. Meaning I don't want to actually build a Python object that represents SQL, I just want to send a text statement. Um, in 2.0, uh, for some historical reasons and some explicitness reasons, we would prefer that you send a textual statement in this object called text, which is there now, it's been there for years. So you make a text object representing your SQL query, um, you can put bound parameters inside the text object of the form colon with a name, and then you send them to the statement, uh, connection.execute statement with a dictionary of your parameters, and then that will run that statement. So when you when we go through these slides, I have logging turned on. So every time I run code, is maybe you have, you're going to have to look carefully to see, and you see, you see this SQL thing, that's uh, SQL that was sent to the database. And then anytime you see other things like Python objects coming back, that, that will be the data we got back. It's going to be mixed up. Um, SQL Alchemy from the very beginning was very had a huge emphasis on 
um, having you see the sequel. That was always like number one from our first tutorial. It was like, when you do this, this is the sequel. It was very, always being, always about being explicit. So what we did when we executed that select statement is we actually got a result object back. Uh, so just to show what we get from a result, kind of briefly, there'll be more of this. We can say result.first, which will give us one row from the result. And then it'll close off the result, which means it's going to close that cursor. That's the DB API is doing. So now we have this row. There it is. The row looks and acts mostly like a name tuple. So just to reiterate, it has row uh, imp was imp ID. So it's a name tuple. Um, if we try to do row imp name, we're going to we'll oh, we get that back. Okay, that's legacy stuff. Um, the, the way the row works, you're supposed to go row zero, you get the first thing, uh, you can say tuple row, get that, it's the same thing. Um, it also has a dictionary interface. So if you wanted to look at the row in terms of keys and get item, which that get item should not have worked on the row, uh, you have row mapping keys, row mapping values, um, different ways to get stuff from the row. Um, usually though, because it's a tuple, uh, the most idiomatic Python style, uh, and I know this because there's a book called Patterns in Python, something like that, that, that shows like the most idiomatic way. And they says um, tuple expansion is the most idiomatic way to do things. So if you get tuples back from an iterator, you go for X, Y, Z in iterator. So this is that format. Someone had a question with the text. Out. Yeah, execute. Yep. Um, so this is an, the other way to use the result is you can use, execute a statement and then you go for for row and result or for expand row and result. Uh, and then I'm just gonna print the stuff here. So you see that there's the SQL and then there's the results coming back. Um, and also uh, I use F strings like crazy now, they're awesome. Uh, SQL Alchemy is still two point, it, Python two, but um, I think F strings are great. So I'll be using those a lot. Um, there's other methods on result and you'll see these just kind of pop in here and there like dot all, uh, which is actually a synonym for an, old, an older method called fetch all. Fetch all is still there, but we have now dot all and dot one and dot uh, scalars, we'll see it all. Um, so when you have this connection that we've connected to, um, it has a method called close. Um, what this close does is it doesn't typically close the connection to the database, it releases it to a connection pool. So when we have this engine and we say connect, it actually made a connection and made it as part of this connection pool that by default will pool uh, five connections. And you can make it pool as many connections as you want. Um, it also has a, a parameter called overflow. So if you pool 20 connections with 10 overflow, you can have as many as 30 connections out at the same time. And if you try to connect beyond that, it'll throttle, it'll, it'll block until a connection is available. And that's a good way to limit how many connections your application opens to a database. So anyway, when you have this SQL Alchemy connection object, you say dot close, that's going to actually release the connection back to the pool. If the connection was part of overflow, it actually will be closed for real. But otherwise, it just gets sent back to the pool. Um, and there will always be, this is configurable, but usually there'll be a rollback called on it because the connection can have had any number of things happening on it, any kind of, uh, if you did some select statements, it could have locked rows, it could have uh, has all kinds of different state or settings that need to be rolled back. Uh, and it'll also roll back other things like if you change the transaction isolation level, it does that. So there's kind of a big rollback stage when you pull the connection. If the connection is just closed, you can just throw it away, but SQL Alchemy will take care of that as best as it knows how at the moment. So even though there's a close method, um, in SQL Alchemy 2.0 and even 1.3, we want you to use context managers as appropriate where you can, because they're way easier to read and they're way more guaranteed to definitely close out resources at the end. That's how we do things. Nowadays, you have, you have a file in Python, you say with file, with open as file handle, closes at the end. Um, SQL Alchemy came out, uh, we were at Python 2.3. I think context managers didn't come out to like 2.5. So we didn't design around them in the beginning, but now we are trying to design around them as much as possible. So at the end of this block, you will, you'll pull a connection from the pool, do stuff with it, and then it'll put it back 
in the pool room, release it, closing the cursor and everything. So that's run the code. And you also will notice that SQL output in 1.4 has this interesting cached thing. So it's going to show you stats on each statement being cached or not. Um, and even though this is a textual statement, there's still some things that had to figure out about that statement that are cached. I'm 30. So a uh, quick thing on trend transactions then. Uh, the way there's a couple of ways to do transactions, uh, and this will be all of them. Um, there's no auto commit in SQL Alchemy 2.0 that's at the library level. So if you run insert statements or whatever, you're going to want to make sure you tell it that, hey, I need you to commit at the end. Um, so one way to do that is when you connect, you can commit as you go. Meaning you say engine.connect as connection, then run some statements, and then you say connection.commit. And then you can run some more statements, and then you can connection.commit again. You can just you can connection.commit as many times as you want. Uh, and this actually works pretty much like the Python DB API does. You can say commit anytime you want on the connection as you go. So we call that commit as you go. So that's one transactional approach. The other is to say engine.begin. And that is an alternative to using engine.connect that will give you a connection that already has a transaction set up. Uh, and then when you run stuff on that connection and then the block ends, the connection transaction will be committed for you. And then the connection will be released back to the connection pool. So it's kind of an all-in-one way. So if you're doing a lot of insert statements and updates, deletes, doing engine.begin is a good way to do that. It means that you are telling the engine ahead of time, I want to commit at the end. Great. Uh, and if there's come some kind of exception raised, it will do a rollback first before it propagates the exception. So if the next error is raised that that's not caught, then you get a rollback. Otherwise, you get the commit. So you can see again, we see begin, insert some, some data. And finally, third way to do it. Sorry, it's still Perl. <laughs> Many ways to do it. Um, you can connect. And instead of doing commit as you go, you can do a, a begin block as you go, which might be helpful if you're passing the connection around and someone wants to do a begin block. So with a begin block, it's just like the engine begin, except you still have the connection at the end. This should be pretty straightforward. So if anyone's super lost, I could slow down. Um, there's that code. Uh, and then this is not this is an extra thing that you can do, and it's not important to understand it now, is that you can do a thing called a nested transaction, uh, which is what SQL can be called a save point. A save point is like a little marker inside of an ongoing transaction where you can kind of have a little sub set of data that is part of your trans. So if you have a transaction that does 10 things, you can create a save point halfway through and do three more things, and then you can roll back to that save point without rolling back the entire transaction. And that's why save points are handy. If you're doing a big, long transaction and you're doing some statements that might not succeed, like inserts that might have an integrity violation, uh, especially the Postgres database, uh, will want you to use a save point. Because if you have an integrity violation inside of a Postgres uh, transaction, it will say, we're done. Roll back the whole transaction. So if you want to be able to recover, you need to have a save point. So begin nested is used for that. Uh, you can make a save point explicitly and then do save point that rollback if you think you're going to roll it back explicitly. Or if you know you want to commit it, you're trying to catch exceptions, you can do a block. So that's a save point, and that's all we have in this talk for save points because they they are what they are. Uh, and that's the SQL that comes out. So begin nested, you can see there's save point, and they have names. So if you have multiple save points, they have different names. SQL Alchemy gives them a name automatically. Save point two. And then release save point means get rid of that save point as, as though it's like a commit. And roll back to save point means undo what that save point had. Um, as far as auto commit, if you actually do want to use auto commit, which you actually have to for some things, like some Postgres DDL operations require auto commit uh, databases. When you want to do a create database call, you need auto commit. Um, if you are writing an application that uses MySQL, and it's read-only, or you have a read-only uh, follower database, and you want it to be fast, auto commit is actually fast. So that's something you should consider for a MySQL application is, is if, if you have a read-only, using auto commit could be a big performance booster depending on your backend. Um, so, and there's ways to make an engine 
that's your engine for writing things, and then you make a sub engine that's the auto commit one for your fast read only operations. Um, so to do that, you do this thing called execution options isolation level. Um, the isolation level is how you actually set the transaction isolation level that will be used, uh, serializable, read committed, repeatable read. Um, and an auto commit is another isolation level because when you have auto commit, there is no isolation because every statement is immediately committed. Uh, and that's how you do that. And that's good to know. It's, it's, it's this kind of a newer, SQL can be one, one dot three does do this, but in one dot four, two point this is the way you do auto commit if you need to. Uh, and also we just changed the login because people were confused. SQL Alchemy still calls the DB API rollback method uh, at the end of an operation. Why are you doing that? It's auto commit. Well, because dot rollback doesn't do anything. So we made the logging and I'm not sure if I want this logging to be so verbose, but it says rollback using connection rollback, but please don't blame us. It's auto commit, it's ignored. As long as your database does support auto commit is not broken. Um, I could have made this just not log anything, but that kind of felt wrong because we're, we're doing connection dot rollback because DB APIs are, are weird and we don't want to mess with them too much. Um, maybe we could take the rollback out, but like if the user changed the auto commit, we just want to have that at the end. Anyway, it's a thing. Uh, and then this illustrates that this row I inserted is was auto committed, which is fine. Um, and that is the end of the end. So that's engines and transactions. And then we go on to schema constructs. I'm also not, I haven't timed this talk, so I don't even know how long. I guess the, the first break is 1030, Calvin. I mean, that's kind of up to you. Uh, you can it, that's halfway through, right? Or Yeah, right? yeah, it would be. All right, so if I get through SQL by 1030, then we could do ORM for the second half and we'll be in good shape. Awesome. Okay, okay, let's do the next thing. Back to the slides. And I'll yeah, put the chat, I'll put the chat. Oh, no, don't do that. <clears throat> so the next level is table metadata, reflection, DDL. What is database metadata? Excuse me. Popularized by Martin Fowler in a book that I liked a lot called Patterns of Enterprise Architecture. <clears throat> database metadata describes the structure of the database, tables, columns, constraints, in terms of, uh, for us, uh, data structures in Python. And for Martin Fowler, it's probably data structures in Java or something like that. Um, when you have this database metadata that describes your tables and your other stuff, it serves as the basis for SQL generation of SQL strings as well as object relational mapping. When you have your uh, metadata structure, you can use it to generate DDL to a blank database. You can build up a whole database to create database, create tables and everything from your metadata structure. Or if you have a existing database and a blank metadata structure, you can generate from the database back to your metadata concept uh, construct. I'm gonna close the chat a little bit later. So metadata can, it goes both directions. You can make some metadata in Python and then make a database from it. You can take an existing database and get a metadata back from what was there. Uh, and by doing so, it forms the basis of this tool called SQL Alchemy Alembic, which is the main migrations tool available for uh, SQL Alchemy. <coughs> and that's the introduction to meta. So we can go to the slides. So um, most people, if people on this talk have used SQL Alchemy, then this, this should be pretty familiar. It's pretty basic. Uh, this is how you make metadata for a table. Um, there's typically going to be more than one table. Uh, so we associate those tables with a collection called the metadata object. Uh, metadata is just a Python object with some dictionaries and stuff inside of it. It's not that interesting. So you make this metadata object. First, that's going to be where I have a bunch of tables. You can have a lot of metadata objects if you want. It's kind of a matter of how you want to organize your things. Um, and each metadata has zero or more tables inside of it. And other XC sequences also, but this out of the scope of the talk. So if I want to talk about a table uh, called user account, I can set up a Python object that looks like a table. Uh, and when I say looks like a table, um, the table uh, class in, in SQL Alchemy is intended to look like a SQL create table statement. 
like it's not accidental how it's laid out. It's a little different than a SQL create state create table statement, but it starts with table like create table and then a name, and then it has the list of columns. And also you can put constraints and constraints and stuff in there too. So if you know what a create table statement looks like, this should be pretty obvious that this is a table named user account, which will have three columns, ID, username, and full name. Uh, this is an int string in, in SQL is this type called the var char. Usually it could be char, but you, we do var char because it's variable length. There's also text. Anyways, var char. Um, null equals false indicates if the column is capable of storing a null value. Uh, and nullable, nullable equals true is the default, which is what it is in SQL most of the time. So this is not in a database. This is just a Python object in my program. It's nowhere. There's nothing to do with any database anywhere. It's strictly the notion of a table that could be somewhere, but it is nowhere yet. Um, it has a name. You can look inside the name. It has a attribute that's very important called dot C, which is an associative array of column of the columns. So if you want to get at those columns that we talked about, user table, see ID is the ID column, full name is the full name column. And if you put a fake name, it should give an error. Great. No, there's nothing called full end. Um, so the associative array of columns inside the table. Uh, it's a bit like a Python dictionary, but not totally, which is why I call it associative array. Um, each column also has its name and it has its data type that we put in. This is basically looking back at what we just told it. But when you get these tables flying around, sometimes you want to be able to look inside them and see what's there. Uh, there's other information that uh, sometimes was implicitly created. There's a, uh, a primary key constraint object because we named one of the columns as primary key. So that means that this table has a, a primary key constraint uh, with one column inside of it. Um, and then the table, uh, when we have these, what we're mainly going to do with them later once we've done DDL is they generate SQL statements. So just for example, I can say print, uh, I can create an object called a select that we'll see later. So a select, and you pass it the table you want to select from. And if you just print it to see what it looks like, it gives you the SQL statement. So this is a, an example of where we made this table metadata with three columns, and that metadata was then used to generate SQL for us. Um, and it's pretty non-controversial, in my opinion. But if you look at people talking about writing SQL versus ORMs, you'd think it's a big controversial thing. Um, table of metadata uh, can be used to generate the schema. So we have this table object. And let's say we have our blank SQLite database. So when I make create engine SQLite without any file name, that means we're going to use a SQLite in memory database, which is uh, a great feature for testing and teaching. Uh, it makes a little database that's in memory and nowhere else, and it's gone when you close the, the connection. Uh, and they're just great for testing. They're great for just building up something quick and experimenting. So we're going to make an in memory database. And then we're going to say engine.begin because when you emit DDL to a database, that actually is something that often needs to be committed. Not always. It depends on if the database does this thing called transactional DDL. Um, the SQLite database actually does do transactional DDL, but the Python SQLite driver gets in the way and makes it not be transactional DDL because of that implicit begin thing. SQLite's driver in Python says, oh, I'm not going to, that's, that's, that's a create table statement. I'm not going to begin yet, which a lot of people find to be annoying. And they're not wrong, but that's how it works. So anyway, when you do metadata create all, you should be in a begin block because it's just something that could or should be transactional. Um, so I said metadata.createAll. I passed it our connection for connectivity. Um, and then it ran these statements on the database. It first uh, does this thing called check first, which is optional. Uh, it looked in SQLite's uh, two schemas, uh, the main schema and the temp schema, to see if user account already existed. And if it was there, it would not do it. Uh, and then it did create table. And that is in our database. So now the SQLite database in memory has this table. And now I'm going too slow because I have to speed up. So <laughs> um, here's another table with more stuff in it, uh, more interesting data types like any num and a numeric. Uh, we can create that table, and it'll do what it can to create that. Uh, SQLite doesn't have any num, so it puts a var char of one, because each of these is one character. This is just good stuff. 
we can look inside the metadata object now and see that it has uh, a two tables inside of it in this uh, collection called dot tables. So it has keys, so it has two tables. And then if we look at the user account table, we can see the a table object is the one that created. We can get it back. Um, and then also if we want to do and this, we'll do this again later. If you want to make tables with foreign key linkages, you uh, use this object called the foreign key at the column level, which means that this new table email addresses will have a, a foreign key constraint referring back to the user account table. As we create that, so the, the, the DDL includes foreign key, references user account ID. Um, and then this is an example that you can look at on the GitHub of a, of a composite primary key with a composite constraint called a foreign key constraint. So that's composite. Uh, and when we create those, you get a table with composite primary key, composite foreign key constraint going back to there. And that's schema creating table. So then we'll go quick through reflection, which is the other way. You have a database that exists already. We want to look at it. OK. You can make a metadata object that's empty, and then you can talk about specific tables that you want to get back. And then you say, OK, well, here's a new metadata. Um, Give me the schema for the user account table. Auto load it with this connection that we have connected. So you can do that. It'll run a bunch of queries. And then you have it back. You can have the, the columns of that table got back and the primary key constraint. And as before, we can make a select statement from it, user account, select user account table. That's reflection. People seem to get that pretty quickly. So I'll go through that quickly. Um, if you want more fine grains looking at stuff, there's a thing called the inspector, which uh, is to be used more. You can inspect an engine, and then the inspector has a method like get table names to give me all the names of the tables that we have in our SQLite database. You can get the columns from a table, like the columns from an email address. And what it gives you here is a kind of a JSON structure, mostly. Uh, and you can just get the raw information about columns if you want to look at that. And you can get the raw information about the foreign key constraints and also the indexes and the unique constraints and everything else that SQL Alchemy knows how to reflect. And then finally, you can also reflect an entire database schema at once, doing this method called make another new metadata object. You could say metadata.reflect, and that will give you the whole thing back in one shot. Lots of queries run. And then you have the tables are in this dot tables collection. You could say tables uh, story table and the publish table. And then you have the story table that we just reflected and the published table and uh, ready to use. You can use these tables and make uh, SQL statements. So this is a good way if you have an existing database and you want to make some queries against it, you don't want to write out all the Python metadata. You just use reflection, get the stuff back and write the queries out. So that's the schema part. How do, and that's kind of the, the basic stuff. So any, anything with that so far? I think most people who've used SQL, I mean, this, this should be pretty familiar. Reflection is awesome when you're doing migrations. Yeah, so the Alembic migration tool uh, relies heavily on, on reflection. Um, actually, uh, in the future, if I have time or someone does, someday we might make it not use reflection because Django's migration tool is probably better <laughs> than Alembic in this regard because they actually version your code. We don't do that, but we probably should someday, but not this year. Sorry, <laughs> for now it's reflection. <laughs> um, metadata and table. Okay, so now we're at the third level. Okay, so basically there's two SQL expression language things, and I need to get done by 10:30, and then we take the break, and then we do the ORM, and then we will have done it. All right. Um, also, I would note. You guys have not seen much new stuff yet. The engine stuff was new. The way the connect, the commit works, that's new for 2.0. The schema stuff is pretty much exactly the same in 2.0. It hasn't really changed. Uh, an expression language, uh, there'll be some new things here. And then ORM, it'll be a little more new stuff. The there's, simple a expression question, there's a question in the chat from Vlad. Yep, let me look at the chat. Yeah. I had the window closed. Yes, you get the constraints back. You get all the, so the question is, do you get constraints that are defined when doing reflection? You get uh, foreign key constraints, you get indexes, you get unique constraints, and you get check constraints. 
You don't get every kind of index yet because some and there's some PostgreSQL indexes that have like functional stuff that we don't reflect yet. Uh, we don't yet get PostgreSQL exclude constraints. So you'll get the, the easy constraints, basically. You'll get the foreign keys for sure. Uh, and you'll get normal, like you'll get, excuse me, rudimentary unique constraints, indexes, and check constraints. Yeah, so the next question is, can I transform directed reflective tables into ORM, ORM classes? Yeah, there's, a, there's been various approaches to doing this. The current approach that's in SQL Alchemy is called AutoMap. So it's a tool that you, it does reflection and then it will figure out how to make an ORM model from that mapping dynamically. Now there's another tool that's third party called SQL AutoCode that actually generates the files like Python code for you. And that's probably more of a robust approach because it gives you the, the models and you can change the code yourself. It's not on the fly. SQL Alchemy's AutoMap is on the fly um, and it's very, very useful. Um, I would not use it in like a production web application that's running at high velocity because you don't want to have to, I mean, like, I think if you're running a, a non-trivial application, your models should be first class defined in code. Um, and that would, that would match what your schema looks like. Um, but if you want something more of a one-off, you can use the auto map to do that. Uh, the auto map is based on a much old, a really old tool called SQL soup, which was also for SQL Alchemy, which doesn't work anymore, but it does the same thing. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, but I wouldn't build a Facebook on that. <laughs> All right. So now we're on to core SQL, SQL. You'll notice I change. Expression language. The SQL expression language builds upon the table metadata that we just did in order to compose SQL statements in Python. So we will build Python objects that represent individual SQL strings, statements that we would send to the database. Uh, these objects are composed of other objects that represent some unit of SQL, like a comparison between a column and some value, uh, a select statement, uh, conjunctions, uh, you know, case statements, cast statements, all kinds of things. Uh, we work with these objects in Python and we build, we kind of compositionally build a structure that represents kind of like a parse tree of a SQL statement. Uh, and then they are converted to strings when we execute them, that's it sent to the database. And you can also print them to see what they look like. And um, when we write these SQL expressions, we're doing this compositional object building one piece at a time thing that uses a, a Python, uh, uses a programming pattern called method chaining. Method chaining is actually, I think from Gang of Four. And it's a pretty obvious technique that everyone's pretty familiar with these days, but it's, it's the one that we use. Um, older versions of SQL, I mean, very, very old, did not use method chaining. We had a select with tons of keywords in it. And we don't do that anymore. Uh, and one of the things that has changed in, in 2.0 is we are fully removing the old keyword based stuff that people don't even know about anymore because I took it out of the docs years ago, but it's still there. So if you look at some very old SQL Alchemy from 10 years ago, you'll see a lot of keyword stuff, no more. So then we go on to the two uh, SQL expression packages. some water for that one. So we start out again, <clears throat> just like we did before. We have this um, table object. Uh, this is not exactly the same as before. It just doesn't have the nullable constraint, but it's same idea. Um, so, and then like we did before, we're gonna do the create all. So we have in our memory database, we have this user account table that we can run queries on. Um, so as we saw earlier, uh, there's a dot C uh, array on the table that gives us the column objects that we have. And um, we can do things with them. This is one of the little, th if you have not seen SQL before, this is one of the weird things it does. Uh, and I actually got this from a very old tool called SQL object written by a guy named Ian Bicking. And he overloaded Python operators like the yeah, Calvin's laughing. That's where I got it. I didn't. I did not think of this. I was like, wow, you can do that. The EQ. The Python has this thing called magic methods. <laughs> Even though magic is bad, uh, like the EQ method is called Dunder EQ, Dunder any, Dunder LT, Dunder GT. And what these do is they return. They're a function that you can implement. So if you have an object with a custom method of comparing it, 
you can do that. And then what you're supposed to do, and concerningly, this is what the Python type stubs insist that you do, which we don't, slight problem, uh, is return a true or false. <laughs> but we don't do that. We actually, this object is, is evaluable as a Boolean. But um, if you compare a column to a string, a Python string, you get not true or false, but you get this weird object called a binary expression. Uh, and that is because it has a left and it has right and it has an operator. Yeah. So that's a boy, that's a binary expression with a left, a right, and it, it's a so it's basically a, a little container that represents the expression we just typed. It didn't actually give us the answer, it just gave us another object asking the same question. What's that about? So, <laughs> you know, basically this is going to be used to generate part of a SQL statement. So user, uh, you know, user table dot username equals SpongeBob, which is the theme of our tutorial, SpongeBob SquarePants. Um, you get back this, if you print it like a string, if you get a string of it, you get back this string that looks like SQL. It has actually a bound parameter called username underscore one, which was dynamically generated. Um, the name SpongeBob vanished. It doesn't seem very useful. Um, it actually is there. So <clears throat> what actually happened when we took that object and we stringified it is it actually this thing called, it did this thing called dot compile. Dot compile made this object called a stir SQL compiler in this case, that is another Python that's got stuff inside of it. What it has inside of it is um, the statement. And then in a separate little collection, it has the params. So basically it took our Python literal, it shoved it out of there because that's a literal and that could be coming from a web form or untrusted input. It could be from anywhere. It's a Python literal. Uh, we take that away. We put it in a bound parameter. And when we invoke this, a statement that includes this little clause inside of it, it'll all work out. <laughs> the SpongeBob value will be sent as a parameter. So this is how SQL Alchemy um, kind of has a role in security, which is that you don't have to remember to use a bound parameter, it's going to do that for you. Anytime you're sending Python literals to it, any kind of input that could have come from a web form or whatnot, um, if you go into the SQL expression language, it's going to kind of automatically make sure all that stuff gets sent as parameterized, um, which is both for the reason that the parameter will be fully uh, escaped from any injection attacks. Uh, usually this is done by the driver, not SQL Alchemy. Um, and also it means that the statement itself is written in an, a way that is agnostic of the literal values that you put inside of it, which means that we can cache your SQL statement in memory and also the database can cache it too. If you, the database also will cache query plans based on this as well. So you definitely wanna use bound parameters uh, because it allows for caching and security on both sides of the equation. Uh, okay, so building bigger SQL constructs we could take, we have the, the equal expression. We could take two of these binary elements and put them together inside of another construct called the or uh, conjunction. So that will give us user account is that, username equals that, or that. And then we can take this pattern ad nauseum, as they say, which I believe means until you're nauseous. So I'm just trying to make Calvin laugh because I can see him. Um, I, it does actually mean that. <laughs> um, we can take the or and put it inside of an and with some other stuff. So we can build, you know, a print, you know, a kind of a composite, you know, expression here. So I, I think people kind of get what I'm doing here is you're making uh, conjunction objects and building up a bigger statement. So now we can move on. Well, let's do some more operators first. Operators, you have greater than equals, between, uh, you put them all together. Between is kind of cool. It's between X and Y. It's kind of a cool operation, you know, not equals. You can have a comparison to null and not null in re relational databases. You don't want to say x equals null because null means undefined. You only want to do is or is not. So SQL Alchemy is smart enough to say if you're comparing to none, make it is not null or is null. Um, operators are type sensitive. So like the ones that where it applies, like the plus sign can be addition from numbers or string concatenation for uh, strings. Like the, the, the double pipe symbol is the general SQL symbol for string concatenation. Uh, the in operator is very cool and is very enhanced in 1.4. Uh, 
Um, what this will do, if you have a username in three values, it's going to uh, do the special symbol that looks very ugly. Uh, and what happens is after the string is compiled, when it gets into the database, we will do a second replace on this to actually br break it out into the individual bound parameters. Because the, the, the Python database drivers, when you do an in, you have to usually, there's a few that don't need this, but usually you have to send <clears throat> each in value. It's a separate bound parameter. So the in operator knows how to break them out into one, two, three values. And if you try to generate an in for an empty set, we have this new feature. It's kind of, it's, it's probably in one three, but it's, it's totally standard in one four, which is it does in from an empty set. And to generate an empty set on the database, every single database has a different syntax that works here. None of them work consistently. Everyone's got like select from subquery or do this or do that. Um, if you have an in from an empty set, an empty set, um, actually simulating that on the database is the best way to get the exact behavior of how in for an empty set would work. Uh, and, and for many years, we didn't do this. For many years, SQL Agma generate warnings. We can't do this. We can't do it. Oh, no, we don't want to do false because it's too simplistic. doesn't work. It works now. <laughs> you can do an in against anything. No more errors. No more exceptions. No more warnings. Um, OK, so now we can start working with some statements. <coughs> Uh, insert and select are the first because we want to insert some data so we can select it back. An insert, uh, you say use your table, like any table object you want, dot insert. And then you have an insert statement and now you want to generate, you want to generatively add upon it some values to insert into the table. Uh, and these go values work with the simple way is uh, keys are the column names and then the values. So we can begin the transaction because it won't commit unless we begin the transaction and run the statement. And you can see uh, the bound parameter format, because we actually sent the thing to SQLite, uh, it now uses question marks for bound parameters, but that's SQLite's bound parameter style. And it passed the two parameters as a sequence rather than a dictionary. Uh, if you ran this against Postgres, you'd see names here and a dictionary down here. So that's where SQL Alchemy is figuring out the six different name parameter formats for you. It's certainly a time saver. Uh, so we just inserted a row. We inserted SpongeBob SquarePants into our user account table. So far, so good. Yeah, Mike, you understand SQL, so I don't have to. Yeah. I want you to understand SQL. The, the first slide was like, you need to know SQL. <laughs> you need to know this. <laughs> this is automation. See, what we're doing is we're automating. Like, I'm not trying to hide it. I want you to see it. We're just making it easier to type. It's type checked. You know, my pie typing, type checking is going to make this even better. Um, so here's some more ways to insert rows. If you don't want to use dot values, which you usually don't have to, it's better to just say connection execute insert and then send it along the dictionary of what you want or send it a, a list of dictionaries, insert multiple rows, and it'll do that for you. Um, we've also made a huge performance improvement on the Psycho PG2 driver in 1.4. Uh, Psychopedia 2 had a very big problem with execute many for inserts where it, they were very slow. And now they are very, very fast in all cases. So enjoy. Mike, there's, there's one more question yep. in the I see uh, it. I'm yeah, I'm now, looking, I'm now looking for the little red one pops up. So now I can, because I don't want to keep the chat and I have to scroll down. Um, you can use joins in SQL Core or ORM, depending on what you want to do. The, using the SQL Core or ORM now, and when we get to the ORM, you'll see this, only depends on what you want to get back because you make the statements in the exact same way now. If you're really working with Core or, or ORM, we use the same select construct, and you'll see that later. Um, it just matters on how you want to run it, if you want to get objects back or not. Um, so the answer is you can join in SQL in Core or ORM, and it, it really doesn't even matter. It's because it's sending the same kind of SQL to the database. The database has the same amount of work to do. Uh, it's just a matter of how you want to do the result processing. That's where SQL Alchemy has more work to do when it gets ORM rows back. Uh, and that's it. So there's no, as far as doing a join, either way. Uh, but you'll see it's very consistent now. It's, it's kind of, you know, kind of, kind of a no brainer because you're, you're using the, the core select to do the join no matter what. Um, 
So select, which now, now that we have some rows, let's select them back. Um, let's make a select statement that is uh, select. So we go from SQL Alchemy and import select. That's the, the construct that we use. So select does not typically, it can. There is a table.select method. However, because we normally want to be able to control what columns and tails we're selecting, we use select as a standalone function. So we import the select function from SQL Alchemy. And then we can build, make a select statement by saying select the username column and the full name column. OK, that's one thing. Dot where, and then you put the binary expression that we saw before in here. You put them all together, and then you run it, get your result back, and then you go for row and result, get the row. And that's what you get. And that's uh, pretty, pretty cool. So you get username, full name, and where this, and you get your result back. So that's that's the basic round trip for using a select object. Whereas in the first chapter, we used this text thing. This is using select to do kind of the same kind of thing, a select statement. So you can select all the columns from a table by putting the whole table in the select, and that'll give you the whole thing. Uh, and the columns will be in the order that you declared them in the table object. Uh, you can do where dot where and you have order by and you have group by and you have having and you have a lot of other methods like prefixes and suffixes and hints uh, so we can get a statement with more stuff going on uh, we can say where multiple times dot where this dot where that and they get joined by and automatically so we have two different where username is spongebob and full name is spongebob squarepants you get the and right here um, and you get a result back. So let's look at some more results. So basically what I'm doing, this is the part where I'm going to go a little quick for the time. And if I see the little number, little red one pop up, and then I'll open the chat or if, if someone wants to, whatever. Um, so we have a result. Let's get a result back and do some things with it. So we're in core. Uh, we're not using ORM at all. The result uh, has a familiar method for people that use ORM called dot one. And one is a method that gives you one row back. Uh, and it expects there to be one row. If there is not a row, it's going to throw an error. And if there's more than one row, it's basically a second row, it will only fetch the first two rows, it throws an error. This is usually when you have like a web form, like a, a web API, and you want to be able to do like a get of an exact primary key or exact instance, you want one row. And if there's no row, you want to return like a 404. Uh, one is good for this. If there are no rows, or there's many rows, like here's a query that'll return multiple rows, result out one will throw an error called multiple results found. So you can actually say, you can use one and catch multiple results found, too many and, and have and handle it very specifically. So we're very good at the one or none case. There's also a one or none, which will raise for multiple results, but not for zero, it'll give you none if there's no results back at all, right? So far so good. Um, results have new features, like you can slice up the kinds of columns you're gonna get back. So here's a, a query that will give us three columns in each row, but we want just two of the columns and we want them in the reverse order. So you say for use, full name, username, and result dot columns, you name the columns you want to get back and that's what you get back. So that's that's going to be hand. This is, this is more of the, the ORM needs this kind of thing for a lot of cases. Uh, so if your result object has the different, you know, you can just change it around and you could also just query for that stuff in the first place, but you know, why not have options? <laughs> um, okay. The more case for this for the the column slicing is the thing called scalars, uh, which is when you have a row and there's only one column that you care about. Usually the first column, but it could be any column. And I don't want rows back. I just want to get the objects back. So if I want to get a list of strings, I could say result that scalars full name, and get just a list of strings that are not in rows. Uh, and this is also very critical in the ORM where you're going to want to get list of objects back and not rows with objects in them, uh, you'll say. Um, update and delete statements um, are kind of like inserts and selects kind of mixed together sort of in this as far as syntax. Uh, updates has the values method that insert does, and it has the where clause that select does, kind of philosophical. Um, so uh, this is an update. Uh, the values is actually going to do the set clause of the update statement. And then the where clause, uh, update user account, set full name equals Patrick star, where username is Patrick, right? Um, 
like an insert, it can also generate the set clause based on parameters. So I could just say, update the rows where username equals Patrick, but I don't tell set. I don't tell it what I want to set later. When I go to execute, I can put whatever I want in this dictionary, and it'll set all those columns. Um, if you send multiple dictionaries, they have to just be the same sets of keys. Uh, and also you can update to, uh, and also insert does this too, you can update to SQL expressions. So if I want to update a column, set it to be some kind of arbitrary expression, like here for no reason, I'm going to concatenate the username and the full name together with a space <coughs> inside of it. I could do that. I could see you update user account set full name equals, and then it'll put the SQL expression here. So you can do that too. Uh, and there's more stuff too. If you can, you can also uh, update a JSON array element on the left side, that's more advanced stuff. Um, and then a, de a delete is kind of a, an update without a, without a values clause. So it just deletes where something. All right. So that's the, the first part of SQL. And then the next half, we're going to do joins and subqueries. So far so good. I need to have the dot dash P. Now we're going to work with two tables. Um, the user account table like we had before. And we're going to make the other table called email address in this case. So you have user accounts and then a user account can have zero or more email addresses associated with it. Um, so to do this, this is called a one to many relationship, right? So the email address table has a foreign key. Uh, which refers back to the user. So every row in it in, is also not null. <clears throat> so every row in the email address table will refer back to a particular user account row. And many different rows in an email address can refer to a single user account row. So they're gonna, we're going to look at how to join and slice up uh, tables on this criteria. Uh, as before, we can do the create all, get our DDL. So now we have two tables that we will select data from. And then we're going to do a big insert data, we're gonna only work with selects in this section. So we're gonna put a whole bunch of rows, well, not a whole bunch, three rows in user table. And then we're gonna put some rows into the address table that have user ID in them that refer back to the uh, user table, okay? And there's those statements being run. So we'll show more capabilities of select. Um, so the first thing you do is select from more than one table. So here's a select statement that is select from user table dot username and address table dot email address. Those are two different tables. What happens if you do this? Uh, it's gonna by default say select user account username, email address from user account comma email address. And that's a query that nobody wants to write. And the reason is because it does this thing called a Cartesian product, which means it's going to get every combination of rows from both tables because they have not been equated to each other. Uh, SQL Alchemy 1.4 now has this great feature that everyone will appreciate highly that it detects Cartesian products in your structure. And it will send you, it's still going to do the query, but it will send you a warning. Uh, select statement has a Cartesian product between email address and user account. You should apply join conditions to resolve. And the reason you're gonna to wanna to resolve that is because when you run a query that has from X comma Y without equating them, you get every combination of every row in both tables together. It is very redundant. Um, and the Cartesian product is the best way to crash your database. If you have a really, if you have two really big tables, this will blow out your memory. So you gotta really watch these things. Uh, so the, the way this works is that when you're in development, and your query has a Cartesian product, but the database is small, you might not notice it because it worked anyway. It was just like 10 rows. And then you put it in production and it blows over because you have a million rows. So the Cartesian product thing is going to give you this warning based on the structure of your query. So the structure of your query is what you're committing to your source control. That's the structure. That doesn't change. So this is a check. This is checking the structure of your query ahead of time so that you don't have any Cartesian products in your source code. And then when you put your code in production, I see this question, it won't blow up. Okay, let's do the chat. Yes, so the question is, can you turn the warning into an error? Python has this thing called the warnings filter and you can 
use the warnings filter to turn the warning into an error and you just send you say warnings that filter warnings uh and then you <coughs> you, you really could have all c warnings turn to error so the answer is yes use the python warnings filter to do that uh and if you have a test suite that runs into pytest it probably uh, you know you might need to put a, this, this fil yeah use it use filters use pytest plugins turn your warnings into errors for sure uh we don't we don't the thing is this, you know, people could have, people do have some cases for confusing products once in a while, but yeah, the answer is yes. Um, so when we want to join the two tables together, there's a new method that you've never seen before called join from, and it also uh, works along with a method called join, which was in SQL Alchemy 1.3 and further previous, but it's very different now in that it actually does something useful. Um, so select user table dot username address table dot email address dot join from the address table you uh, join from the user table to the address table. Please do that for us. Okay. And then you'll get a join. And now you get only, you know, five what really like you get a reasonable number of rows. So it runs select with join. And it seems to have figured out how to join the tables too, because these two tables have a foreign key between them, that is not ambiguous. That's just a single foreign key between address and user. So SQL is like, oh, I can join those on the foreign key. Now, um, there's also join, which works like it does in the ORM, for those who know join. You can say user table, user table and address table dot join. Um, dot join without uh, specifying anything else is going to use the, the leftmost table as the, the from table, and it'll join to the address table on the foreign keys. But join from is more explicit if it's being, is not sure how to join from. Join from is probably better to use for starting your chain of joins. And then dot join is better to continue your chain of joins, but you can use either one. Uh, and we get the same thing. And then um, if your tables have more than one foreign key constraint or they have no foreign key constraints or you want to just make sure it's explicit in your code that's fine you can send another argument to join or join from which is one of those binary expression things and instead of relating uh, a table column to like a python string we're relating to call uh, one column to to another column object to get our join condition so we have this it, all all three of these examples generate the same exact sql um, these are just different levels of explicitness. Uh, and the join uh, method, join from, will give you throw, it'll throw an error if it doesn't know how to join. If it says, this is ambiguous, there's too many foreign keys, or I, I don't know how to join these, please tell me, you would go down to joining in the more explicit way. So SQL Alchemy, I should probably find a way to write about this, has one of its, philosoph one of its philosophies is that it kind of guides you to the correct code by throwing very informative errors. It, it looks a lot for you're doing the wrong thing. Okay, maybe you meant this. It's, and people who have worked with it will know that the way they got their mappings to work is that it raised all these different errors until you finally got it right. And that's intentional that, um, and it really goes to, and then here's, here's a little tidbit that you probably won't hear me say much. This is the reason it's called alchemy because the you know cartoon character version of the alchemist constantly blowing himself up <laughs> that's the whole thing that's actually really what this is is like you do you're, you're doing alchemy hmm maybe this will work oh cartesian product hmm maybe this will work oh there's ambiguous foreign keys oh okay now you got it the difference between alchemy and sql alchemy is that you actually get gold at the end ha 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 <laughs> it's all for my one person audience here <laughs> <laughs> okay, crazy query time. Um, for people who are okay, pretty good at SQL, you might know that you can refer to a table more than once in a query. You can uh, use this thing called an alias. You can say select uh, star from table as alias one, uh, table two as alias two. Why do we want to use an alias in a SQL statement? Because you might want to get rows from the same table in different contexts. So I want to get uh, to, I want to get a row from email address in how it relates to the user table in one way. And then I want to get another uh, row in how it relates to the user table in another way. 
uh, and that will actually name in this query, it'll name the address table twice using this thing called alias. So when we write SQL by hand, we had to say select star from account table as account table alias or whatever. Um, SQL Alchemy takes the whole job of making up those names. You can name it if you want, but SQL Alchemy automates the naming of those names because they don't actually matter as long as they match up. Each time you use the address alias, it uses the same name. Each time you refer to the address alias too, it'll use a different name. Those names themselves are random. That way um, you can add more aliases and you don't have any issues with, oh, I named this, that, named this, that, what's his name? Uh, when you work with the full-blown SQL Alchemy core expression language approach, you don't worry about names anymore because the, it figures them out for you. Everything the, the referring to a certain table is based on the Python object identity. So we have the address table object. We've made this new object called a dot alias, called address alias one. We made a second address alias object called address alias two. These two variables uh, now refer to alias objects. And as we refer to them, in our select statement, they will come out to refer to those certain things. So we're gonna select from the user table and we're gonna select the email address from each of the address alias tables, you know, derived tables, we, you know. We're gonna join from the user table to the first alias. And then we're gonna join from the user table to the second alias. So this is kind of a Y shape. Join goes from user to both user address alias one or address alias two. And then we're going to add a where criteria for both of those aliases separately. Uh, and this is more advanced SQL. If you just know select star from table, this is a little more. Um, and then you get the query uh, did the right thing where you have it selected from user account, then it joined to email address as email address one and did the on clause. And then it did a join to email address as email address, well, three, because the that number two got used up here on user account uh, is email address three dot user ID. So it basically worked out the on clause and everything we did and then did the where criteria separately. So we got um, SpongeBob having both a Gmail address and a SpongeBob.com email address. That makes sense. I don't see my little number popping up. So I guess that may, up. Oh, there's a number somewhere popped up. <laughs> Chat. Do, 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 do. How long do the alias stay available to use? It's a Python object. So that's that's it, that, the Python object that you have. As long as you hold on to that object, you can use it everywhere. You can use it, yep. There's no thread safety implications. You can just, it's just a Python object. It's it's fixed. Um, SQL Alchemy is really trying to make sure these objects are immutable, which they're not, but they act, you treat them as immutable. <laughs> You know, they're pretty immutable. We don't, so that meaning when you have an immutable structure, you can send it around everywhere and not worry too much about somebody changing it. Um, and then finally, well, not quite finally, but now that we know how to do aliases of tables, you can do aliases of a whole select statement as well. So you have, you can derive uh, a table into an alias. You can also derive another query into a subquery that also acts just like an alias. And in SQL Alchemy 1.3, uh, this was, we, we, we would say select, we would we would refer to a select construct and then say dot alias. So now we're referring to the select construct and saying dot subquery, which is more explicit. So here we have um, a select sub, we call it sub Q for subquery. Let's do the query where we do so the user table, username and the address table email address, join from user table to address table, and then we're going to call it a subquery, which means that this is no longer a select statement. It's now this uh, selectable thing that we can add to a bigger select statement called a subquery. When we have a subquery, it acts like a table. It uh, has a, a dot C attribute. It has columns that it, it exports. So in this case, the subquery will have um, the username and the email address columns on it because that's what's in our subquery. Uh, and then we can select from the subquery. And then we can do criteria based on the subquery as though it were a table. It's called a derived table in, in the relational whatever. <laughs> so, and again, we see the, the, um, the anonymous names of things. The subquery gets this name called a non one, which is based on, it's gonna be a non underscore number, but it's based on a random token. So we're gonna select the username column from this 
derived table called a subquery. That is our little subquery as a non one. And then the where clause is against the outer a non one. So that's the general idea of how to write a subquery and how to how to use it. Um, and for people that have used SQL, I mean, this is old hat. For people who are this is new to, that's like, wow, that's kind of interesting. Um, so far, so good. Um, and then we can make a more complicated subquery that's going to use some aggregate SQL functions. Let's get um, the user ID uh, column from the address table. And let's also count how many rows are in each grouping of user IDs. So if you know about SQL group by, uh, group by is usually used with SQL aggregate aggregate functions. Aggregate functions are those that were, are going to do some kind of calculation across a, a group of rows. Uh, counting is the simplest one. Uh, the max and min functions will get you the highest or the lowest value. Uh, you can write aggregate functions to do things like standard deviation and stuff like that. There's all kinds of aggregates. Count is the most common. Um, so we're going to count the number of rows within each grouping of distinct user ID. So SpongeBob, I think has two email addresses. You, you would get two for him. And then Sandy has one email address. You would get one email address for them. Um, and then we're going to put that inside of a subquery. Because uh, this subquery is giving us just part of the information that we actually want. This gives us the count per user ID. But we also, we also want their names. So let's put that into a bigger query called username plus count. So we're going to say um, select another select statement. OK, select from us, select from our database the username column as well as the count column from this subquery. The reason we use the word count is because we labeled this thing as count. When you use SQL functions with the func namespace, uh, you're going to want to use dot label of some kind because the func doesn't really have a name. It's not going to call it count because it's, it's just it wants you to give a name to it. So you should give a name. Um, select the username and then the count from each subquery. And you're going to join from user table to the subquery. How are we going to do that? And order by the username. Now, this is funny because this is a, a select statement. It's a subquery. There's no foreign key from a select a subquery to the user table. So how is, is it going to join? Well, it turns out that SQL Alchemy has this thing that took me 10 years to get right, which is it can do this thing called column correspondence, which means that it's going to look inside the subquery. Let me look inside the subquery. Oh, look, there's this column inside of it, which is user ID, and there's a foreign key to that. So I should join to that. Oh, I can do it. It's not good, but it's not going to join to the address table column itself. It has to join to the user ID column in terms of the subquery. This is not code you want to write. <laughs> Boy, was it hard. But now you have it. So when I run this code, <laughs> You get select user account username, a nom one dot count from user account table, join to our subquery on user account ID is a non one user ID because that's the column that is derived from this foreign key column. And then you get your result back. And that is one of the, this is an example of automation, right? SQL, I just figured that out for you. Now you could write it yourself, sure, but. This, you know, should be fairly obvious what it says. It automated it, but we understand what we're doing because we're not that we're not hiding it. Um, okay. Now, there's another thing in SQL that is super popular now. It's because the Postgres database is big on them, called the common table expression. Uh, a common table expression is just mm, it's like a subquery, except it's not in the from clause. It's like above your whole select, and it's in this thing called a whiff. Um, and common table expressions, I think, are popular for a few reasons. They offer some new features like recursive queries. Um, and they also can be optimized. They can produce very optimized uh, forms in some cases. Uh, Postgres uh, can optimize the CTE better than it can as a subquery. Uh, there's this whole set of rows that you can get from. And then and so also people find them more intuitive sometimes. Uh, I'm not there yet, but I, I get it. Um, in SQL Alchemy, the CTE looks the same in Python. We can take the same exact select statement that we had before as a subquery, this address select, which we said address select dot subquery, and we could say dot CTE. OK, so now you're not a subquery anymore. Now you're a CTE. OK, what does that mean? Well, we use it exactly the same way. There's literally no difference in this 
I can't do backwards in this this thing I'm running, but this is the same syntax. <laughs> it's the, right before we had address subquery. Now we have address set CTE. Uh, so you can flip it around. Now, of course, it's not that simple. CTEs have all kinds of other goofy things they can do, but that's in the docs, not here. <laughs> so for the purpose of this, you can see if I just run that, we get the same results back, uh, but you see the SQL is with, instead of is selecting from subquery as a non one, now it's with a non one as, and then there's the thing that was the subquery before. And then again, we have the same logic with select user account, a non one count, and then it joins in the same way. So a CTE from a very simplistic view is kind of like a subquery that's on top of your select, uh, but then it allows for some very crazy kinds of stuff. And you can use them with update and delete statements in, in uh, inserts also in Postgres, they, they go nuts with CTEs. So we have CTEs. Um, what's next? Oh, okay, finally, this is probably the last part. Um, correlated subqueries, and this is the last thing, so we'll take a break after this. A correlated subquery is a subquery that is in the columns clause or the where clause of an enclosing select statement. So whereas the previous subquery we did was a from clause subquery that says select star from a subquery. A correlated subquery is a subquery that returns that should return exactly one column and one row only. And it is used as a column expression in a bigger query. And they're usually, but not necessarily, what we call correlated to other stuff in the table. So when we wanna do that, we tell SQL Alchemy our intent, we make a subquery that we want. We wanna select the count of address rows as a column correlated to each row of the user table. Uh, so we make a query like that and we say dot scalar subquery to tell SQL Alchemy intent, hey, this is gonna be a scalar subquery. You should now behave as a column expression and do correlation as needed. Uh, when we do this, it refers to this subquery just to print it out. Um, when you print the correlated subquery by itself without any context, it says from email address user account, which again, well, yeah, for, it has a, a where clause here, so it's not a Cartesian part, but it has the two tables there. So we're not correlating to anything here yet because the user account is right there. So if we take that correlated subquery and we use it as a column in another select statement, now it's gonna be different. It's gonna be select, username over here and then select this count we did from email address and the other user account from clause disappeared because the correlated subquery figured out oh the user account is out here so when i join from user account to email address user account is actually on the outside that's called the correlated subquery so sql alchemy has logic to figure these things out and you can also tell it explicitly to correlate against something if that doesn't work or you could tell it explicitly to correlate against everything except that. And that's the correlated subquery, which people often will map, make column uh, ORM mappings that will have a certain column doing that. So that's that's that. So this is basically the intro to SQL expressions. The main thing that was new here that's not in 1.3 at all is select.join and select.join from. Those don't work at all in 1.3. There is a join method, but it's totally broken. So that's totally new stuff. And it works a lot like the ORM query does. Uh, and then also the scalar select and subquery methods. Uh, those exist in 1.3 with different names. Those are new names. Oh, there's a little addendum to SQL expressions. If you already have the perfect SQL, use text. <laughs> so um, I get these questions a lot like, I'm having trouble making this, and it's usually a Postgres query. I'm having trouble making this query in SQL Alchemy. I'm like, put it in text. <laughs> it's done. Like you don't have to do it. So, okay, why was this whole SQL expression language thing we just did? Why would we use it? Why do we need it? Or why do we not need it? Because maybe you don't need it and you don't need it. You don't need it if you don't want it. What it gives you is composability. Like you have this select, you want to add other criteria to it. You want to just uh, iteratively build up a query. And that's very handy. And it you know also you know works with your Python IDE and everything. Uh, and then the other one is database agnosticism. Our query will run on lots of different backends, uh, depending on what kinds of features we used in the query. But you know, when we build up a query, we have a good you know, platform for a lot of different databases because every database has all kinds of different things, mostly with data types and so there's structural things. Um, what if we have the perfect SQL query already? Use text, you know, if, if there's no need to 
you know, if you just want to run this query, and it's usually some statistical thing with a lot of weird functions and casts inside of it. If you don't need it right now in the expression language, just run it in text for now, have it in your code, you're fine. Just, you, you can change it later. You know, there's no, you know, you don't have to do it. So that's just a, a little addendum to SQL expression language. And you can do text with the ORM. Um, it's not in this tutorial, but there's some, it's, it's in the tutorial online and people don't seem to do it much, but you can, you can write a textual, any query you want, as long as it has the columns that the ORM needs to build an object, it, you can do it. And it's, SQL Alchemy has always supported that. Uh, we do it much better now. There were some problems with it, but it should work. No one seems to do it much. Uh, just remember, if you write text, don't, in, don't stick any user input in the text. <laughs> always use a bound parameter. Uh, and the text construct has a way of doing this. You put brown parameter holders. Just don't ever concatenate untrusted input into a SQL string. That's the, the golden rule. Don't ever do it. Um, okay, so then we can go to the object relational mapping. So the whole first hour and a half of this, we did not do object relational mapping. You know, when people talk about ORMs, it, uh, there was a very there's a very specific thing about SQL Alchemy that a lot of most tools don't seem to have, which is that SQL Alchemy has this whole entire thing that works without any ORM happening whatsoever. Um, the reason that wasn't ORM is because we were not using D, uh, data classes of some kind. We were not using any user-defined objects. We were just getting we were just getting rows back. Um, so you can use uh, SQL automation tools without using the ORM at all. Uh, but now we're going to do the ORM. So um, just to introduce, kind of quick. So we have till twelve. Okay, show the time. Two, eleven, eleven. Okay. What's the what does ORM mean? Uh, to SQL Alchemy. Uh, it's the process of associating object-oriented classes with, with database tables. Uh, we refer to the set of object-oriented classes as a domain model. This is a, kind of the formal name, the domain is your domain model or your business model. Uh, the most basic thing the ORM should do is if you have domain object, you can save the domain object to the row of the table. And if you have row in your table, you can load it into your domain object. That's the most basic ORM thing. If you wrote your own application that doesn't use an ORM, but you wrote this, you wrote an ORM. You are using an ORM, just your own. That's, <laughs> that's it. If you have an object come from your row, you're in, <laughs> you're ORMing. Um, so most ORMs that are you know, downloaded you know, uh, do uh, associations between tables, uh, foreign key, Associations that can give you one to many or many to one, and then there's also uh, the this the many to many using I guess they call it a pivot table or it's called, we call it a secondary table association table. Uh, so ORMs do this kind of thing for you because it's kind of tedious to do it by hand. Uh, they provide a, a way to query the database in terms of your domain model. They can represent class inheritance sometimes. They can sometimes do sharding of your data. If you want to have different kinds of data in different databases, like you want to have all the A through A through F in one database and G through M in another database, that's called sharding. Uh, concurrency patterns, uh, like uh, if you have an object and suddenly the row is missing from the database, that means some other transaction has just taken it out. That's a concurrency pattern. Uh, row versioning means that if you're row is version three and you go to update it and the update statement sees that the version is at seven, that's a concurrency problem. That means someone else has put three three versions of your row in, and you're you're behind. So you're not up to date. It gets rejected. It's a concurrency feature. Um, data validation, data coercion, uh, you know, set setting dates on your model objects. I mean, this is clearly a little bit outside of validation is more of a Python concern that's handled by other Python libraries, but we, we have structures to do this. Um, flavors of ORM. Uh, everyone talks about active record for data, data mapper. Uh, for me, what active record and data mapper means is the object itself has its own persistence method stuck on it. So, and this is every ORM everyone writes, you know, is you have your user and then you say user dot save and it magically goes to some database somewhere, somehow. <laughs> but you said save, so it's going to go there. And then, oops, 
and then you uh, can query later, and then you can change it, and then you say dot save again, and it'll do an update. That's active record, meaning that every object is an island onto itself. Every object is a, is a row in a table. As far as how they integrate with a the transaction, there's probably some kind of a global context manager, or maybe you pass something to save. Kind of like the, the notion of a lot of objects working together in a transaction is a secondary notion, right? It, the active record means that each row, it's just it's just a row on a table. Why do I care? Come on, just put it in. You know, and I have 25 other rows. Well, they're all just they're all going, to, going to, who cares? That to me, clearly I'm being derogatory. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> active record. Data mapper is more about, no, no, no. First of all, we have to connect to the database, okay? Second of all, everything you're gonna do here because you're not just doing one row, you've, you've probably got a bunch of rows is gonna be in a transaction. And you're gonna tell us when to commit the transaction. So this is data mapper. Um, okay, you've got a user, you have an address, you've got other stuff, give me all those, put them all in this thing. And this thing will persist them. This is the persister object. This is the, you know, mediator, you know, it's explicit. There's an explicit mediation between your objects and your database. And it makes you be more explicit about where your transaction is, what database are we talking to, where is this even happening? Uh, we're not using globals, we're not using thread locals, we're not doing that stuff. We have, this is my transaction, this is where I get my data from. Oop, and then I did that again, and then you get your stuff back. So that's data mapper. Um, two styles of configuration. Uh, declarative style is what uh, I referred to was, was most ORMs everywhere do, is you have classes that uh, name the attributes and the attributes themselves refer to how they will be, how they will be persisted in the database. Um, that's declarative style. Um, this is what Cogme usually does. Uh, there's the other style I now call uh, imperative style, meaning you make a class that doesn't know anything about anything at all about the database, and then somewhere else you have this mapping process that will link some kind of table metadata with that class. Um, I was going to take imperative style out of Cogme 2.0, but a lot, a lot of people want to use this style still. So good, they can use it. Um, one of the things that's kind of not wrong, but misleading about imperative style is that when you say class user with just a constructor and it knows nothing about the database, the mapping process is going to instrument this class to have these attributes on it. And the class will take on all kinds of database specific behaviors. It will take on all kinds of behaviors that are specific to the SQL Alchemy ORM. So you really can't say that the class is totally agnostic of the mapping process because you might have areas where it accesses the full name attribute and it assumes that that was persisted from somewhere. So this, that's why I think imperative style is a little bit of a lie, but it still uh, is, is uh, applicable. People want to use it. And it also is applicable for, uh, to some extent to stuff like Python data classes, which you can map now. Uh, you can map those declaratively also. Anyway, those are the two styles. SQL Alchemy ORM is essentially a data mapper style ORM. Most users use declarative style. Uh, the ORM extends core, extends the SQL expression language to work with domain classes. Uh, key features include this thing called the unit of work pattern, uh, which is a uh, system that ac accumulates pending changes and then transparently sends insert, update, delete statements to the database to persist those changes in one in a batch. The identity map is very uh, important. Uh, as we work within a transaction, uh, Python objects are kept unique in memory based on their primary key identity. So if you select for the same primary key identity twice, you'll get the same object back. And that's important because it keeps it in sync. Like if some part of your code is changing the object and then some other part of your code selects the same row again and does something else, those are two different. You want them to be synchronized in, in the transaction. Uh, and that's because they represent a row in a transaction. And that's, that's the row in that transaction. Uh, lazy eager loading. Related attributes and collections can be loaded either on demand, which is called lazy loading, or upfront, which is called eager loading. And we'll, if we get all the way to the end of everything in this tutorial, that'll be at the end, lazy and eager loading. ORM walkthrough. Okay, so we start with the ORM basic. And like the SQL tutorial, the basic part will deal with just one table, and then the advanced will deal with the two tables and, and the joins. So, 
keeping in mind that uh, for those of us who know SQL Alchemy, the way that you use SQL Alchemy right now still works completely. You still have the declarative base. You still have all the same stuff. And it's all there. But there's a new way to map, which is what the, the declarative base now builds upon called the registry. And the registry is uh, kind of like your declarative base, uh, except it's more general. Uh, you can do uh, imperative mappings with the registry as well. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that the registry can do, like configure the mappers within it and not everywhere else. So we make this object called the registry. And it's kind of like the metadata, you know, it's kind of a collection, has a metadata inside of it. And when we want to map a class, the most immediate way, and this is not the only way you can still use declarative base, <laughs> is to use it as a decorator. Uh, and this is probably a more slick way to map than the declarative base was. Because the declarative base, uh, for those who know it, uh, uses a Python meta class, uh, which is fine. Uh, the Python meta class gets in the way for people who want to do things with meta classes. Uh, the, you, we, you never really need a declarative base. It's, it declarative meta it just was there as an implementation detail. Um, you can use the decorator. And you can map the class. And it doesn't have to extend from any hierarchy at all. And you can use whatever meta class you want. It doesn't matter, because SQLQ doesn't really care about meta classes. Uh, so that was one of the things that declarative meta was kind of misleading. People thought that meta class was involved. It doesn't have to be. Um, so this is a user uh, class that's being mapped to a table. Um, and you'll notice with declarative mapping, and again, there's options for this, we don't have to use the table object explicitly. We can say user and map this user. And when you map it, create a table for us called user account based on table name. And we will map these three attributes, user ID, username, and full name. And when you map them to a table, please make the table have these columns, uh, an integer column, a string column, a string column. Um, there is a syntactical helper here, which is that we don't have to restate the name in the column. If you remember, recall from the schema chapter, we, columns had a name in them. You can omit the first argument and just put the, the data type. Uh, this reaper is just for this tutorial so you can see what the objects are when we select them. You don't need to have a reaper. Uh, and you also you notice you don't need to have a constructor. Uh, the constructor, if you don't make one, you can make one yourself. If you don't make one, is automatically generated against uh, one that will accept these three names as optional keyword arguments. So when we did that mapping, uh, there's now this new uh, Dunder table attribute that got stuck on it by the mapping process. The, the registry mapping decorator did this. I'm trying to move this. Uh, User.table, so here, you have user table name is the table name, and then user.table is this table. And then we can, this won't work, so I didn't import select from SQL Alchemy, import select. You can select it, ugh, print it like that. So a table got generated for us using declarative style and has been associated with this user class. And the user class has been mapped to this table uh, for use with the ORM. And the object that does the mapping is this thing called mapper, which you don't generally have to deal with, but it's, it's there. So the object has a default constructor. So we can uh, send it some keyword arguments, and they're all optional because some of them might be auto-generated. Like, for example, the ID of this uh, row will be automatically generated by SQLite because SQLite has a auto-increment feature for a single integer primary key. Uh, nothing's happened with the database, by the way. We haven't touched the database at all yet. This is just an object in Python, and it's just an object in your, in your, Python, in your Python code. Um, if you look at the ID attribute, that's going to be the primary key. Uh, it comes out as none, OK? So it seems like it was already there. Even though we didn't assign to it, it seems like it's already there. So using our registry, which now has this table object in, in, the, in its metadata collection, we can uh, create, do the create all that we've done on all the other tutorials. We can create the schema using mapper registry dot metadata dot create all. And there's your user account table like we've seen before. And now we want to actually do things with the table. OK, so here's where the data mapper starts up. We work with this object called the session. Uh, 
And there's a few ways to do the session, but the, the most common way is to make this factory called the session maker. The session maker is a thing that will give us sessions. And the reason session maker is convenient is that you can hand it all the arguments that you are going to use for your sessions up front. So we want the session maker to be bound to this engine that we've just used to make our tables. And once again, there's a future flag that will turn on a couple of little, it's, it's, it's a couple of transactional behaviors change with session if you turn the future flag on, which in SQL Alchemy 2.0, this flag will do nothing and future will be the only way that it works. So you make your session maker and uh, the convention I usually use is to call it uppercase session because it's kind of like a class that will make new objects. Okay, so we've, we have an engine, we have a session maker that's gonna bind to the engine. Let's make a session. So then we go here and we have session. So now we have this thing that is bound to this engine. It's gonna be able to work with objects. Um, and like everything else in SQL Alchemy, nothing has happened yet. It has not connected. It has not looked at the engine. It hasn't made a transaction. It's not done anything whatsoever. It's just an object with an object inside of it. Um, everything in SQL Alchemy, as far as engines, is lazy initializing. So we have this object called SpongeBob, just to, just to review. There's SpongeBob. Uh, and now we've added that object to the session using a method called add. So session.add, and then you send out the object that you want. Uh, nothing happens. Nothing has happened yet. Nothing was updated, inserted. Uh, we can look at the object in this collection called session.new, uh, which says, okay, your SpongeBob object is in my .new collection. That's nice. Um, and we call that a pending object. So we say that SpongeBob is now pending. When the SpongeBob object was not in the session, we call it transient. So SQL Alchemy has these notions of object states. There's five object states. There's, uh, and I'm gonna forget the fifth one because it's new. <laughs> Is transient, this is an interview question. Transient, pending, persistent, detached, and uh, pending delete is the last one. Um, so, so far we have an object that's transient and now we have an object that's pending. And also this notion of object states uh, comes from Hibernate. I studied how Hibernate session works and that's how I came up with these terms. Um, okay, so. The row is pending, we haven't connected, we've done nothing. Nothing has happened, but yet we're gonna do this crazy thing. We're actually gonna to try to query the database, which seems ridiculous because we haven't even connected yet. There's nothing in the database. Why would we do that? Well, the session is doing this thing where it's trying to create this transparent experience where you add things to it and that you can get them out again. And it will always try to make sure whatever is supposed to go to the database will go to the database as late as possible, but not later than that. And you'll get it back. So what's gonna happen is we will make a select statement like we did before um, using import select like we always did, um, except instead of sending the select a table object or columns, we're gonna send it the user class. We wanna select user objects, not just rows. We wanna select user objects and we wanna filter them where their username is SpongeBob. Now filter by is actually part of select. Uh, filter by is a little convenience method where you can just send it simple key value pairs for just where X equals Y. If you want more elaborate criteria, you can go to, back to using the, the dot where method, which we'll see. And then instead of using the engine connection to run the statement, like we did before, the session also has an execute method that looks just like the execute method on the connection. So we have this select statement that looks a little different. It's selecting this domain model class, which is weird. And then we're going to run it with this session thing, which is weird. And then what's even weirder is that there's nothing in the database. What the heck's we're, we're going to get back? Well, what the session will do is it will auto flush whatever is pending before it runs a query. And then when you run another query, it will have nothing to flush and it'll be done. So it makes sure whatever you've got ready to go Oh, you want to query? Let me let me push out what I got first. Now let's go and query the database and see what we have. So just that running the select with auto flush, and of course you can turn auto flush off. Probably about thirty percent of people use the ORM turn auto flush off because they don't like it. 
which is fine. It's just they mean that they, they've got to make sure that they do the flush manually. Um, but for the tutorial, we're showing you the, the full Cadillac version. <laughs> um, so what happened is just doing that execute said, oh, okay, let me begin the transaction. Let me flush the pending object. Let me run your select statement. Let me get it back. And then I will turn to you a result object with pending, possibly pending results inside of it. So that's what just happened. And then we can use the result object and we'll use another method called dot scalar, uh, which is, again, this is the same result object that you used in core. It's actually a different subclass. If you look at the actual class, it's different, but that doesn't matter. They're all, they're all subclasses. The important part is the one that's cut off, result. This is the important one. So you work with the result object. Okay, that's the MRO. Anyway, so we we did result and we called dot scalar, which will give us the first column of the first row. And what that did was it gave us, uh, we assigned that first column of the first row to another variable called also SpongeBob. And if we look at also SpongeBob, we see it is a user object that has magically come back to us from a result set. So the database doesn't know how to set us objects, but the SQL Alchemy session translated the row from the database, the raw row that had the that had these columns in it. It looked at the primary key identity. Oh, this is primary key number one. Let me give you the user object with primary key identity number one back. Because we asked it for the user class. And that's the round trip. So we got that back. And we see that because of the flush, our original SpongeBob object, that's the one that we added that had none for ID, all of a sudden seems to have a primary key on it so that it, it modified. So the ORM, unlike the core expression language, the, or, the, the, the domain objects of the ORM are very much mutable objects. Um, and mutable state has a lot of, has, has, a, has a pretty bad rap these days in computers. Um, the ORM is based on domain a domain model that's object oriented and assumes mutability, so it things will change. So in this case, uh, dot ID was changed to be the number one. Um, and then also, the session. This is where we see this thing called the identity map, because we have queried for the SpongeBob ID number one. Uh, it gave us the same object back, and that's called the identity map. The identity map means that when you query <clears throat> for primary key number one from a certain table, you get the same object back every time as long as that object is in memory. Um, and the whole entire thing built in that concept and it's pretty, pretty critical. And the identity map is you can look at it too. You can, you can go session.identity map and look at the items. Um, you don't wanna mutate this map yourself. You wanna have the session put stuff into it for you. Um, but if you want to see what's there, which you usually don't really have to, but if you want, there it is, you can look at it. Um, so now we're going to look at some more uh, use cases for changing data, making changes. Uh, we can add more objects uh, using another method called add all. Uh, add all is the same as add, except you can send a list of objects. So if you want to add a lot of objects at once. So we'll add two more user objects. And they're pending. Again, nothing happens. Nothing happened. Um, and then we'll also make a change to our original SpongeBob object. Let's modify SpongeBob's, SpongeBob's full name to be SpongeBob Jones. And again, nothing has happened. Nothing is updated. Nothing. No. No SQL has run at all. We're just. We're, we are, however, in a pending transaction because we, we did a begin. If you were running this against the Postgres database right now, and you went and looked at your Postgres uh, information schema that would show you the current, uh, current whatever the view is called, current, current processes, it would show uh, opening transaction for our process. I mean, normally the computer would be running this for us. We wouldn't be sitting here at the console, but we're going very slow. Um, so now, we can look at more things in the session. The session knows which objects are quote unquote dirty, meaning we change SpongeBob's name to be SpongeBob Jones. It knows that. And it has 
the two objects that are pending that have not been inserted yet. These are still, these are pending. And uh, then we can say, hey, session, okay, we're done. Commit the transaction. And that will commit everything. So commit will always flush whatever is not flushed yet and commit the transaction. And then the session goes to a completely neutral state after that. So when we run this code, you will see <clears throat> it runs the update for SpongeBob Jones. <clears throat> And then, excuse me, and then it will insert the rows for the uh, that we had pending. And now all three objects are what we call persistent, meaning they represent a, a, an active row in the database. So when an object is, is, is associated with a session, has a primary key identity, and there's a row in the database with that primary key, you're now what's called persistent. Um, another behavior that you very often will want to turn off, but is the default quote unquote Cadillac level of automation. Definitely not appropriate in all cases is that the commit will expire everything on your objects. So the objects are in fact empty. I'm gonna do the quest, I see a, I see a one. Uh, the question is, is it fair to say that the session manager is like a reference pointer manager where it will mutate data in place rather than creating new things, even if it isn't maxly memorized? Um, I guess. Um, I haven't done C programming in a long time. Oh, I do it for the excesses, but yeah, it's, uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, the Python objects themselves are in place. It's, yeah, so the session maintains those Python, those Python objects that you give it in, in memory. Um, it actually does it using a nice weak referencing pattern where if you lose references to your objects and the session has no pending changes, it will, it will also lose references as well. Uh, but yeah, it certainly is a pointer. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I would say it, you're, it probably is fair to say that, although I don't think it's clear, but yeah, I think it's fair to say that. Sure. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I can't give you a better answer. Um, but we'll we'll go on and we can we can test that theory some more. Up oh, number no, no, number one. <laughs> Neat makes sense. Great. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, the session <clears throat> is default Cadillac level behavior is that it wiped everything out of the memory state. So it still has the objects. It has three user objects. They're there. What happens is the inside of them, the, the dict is empty, and what that's going to do is that when you access them again. The session will be like, oh, you want to see these again? Let me open a new transaction. Let me get the rows back for these objects. Let me show that to you again. Um, so what's going to happen when we say SpongeBob.FullName, this is going to be the first example of what we call a lazy load, meaning upon Python attribute access, you say .fullName, oh, boom, I'm going to have to run a query. Now, you can see why this might not be desirable behavior, because if you commit a whole bunch of objects and then your code keeps moving, you're going to have crap loads of these queries. So uh, you might, depending on what you're doing, you might want to turn expire on commit off, or you might want to make sure you just work with it, it, everything in one big transaction. The reason uh, the session expires everything by default is because once the transaction is over, now your data is, is out there in the database. It is now subject to any number of other transactions that want to work on it. And there could have been other concurrent transactions even waiting to send updates to what you've been working with. So once the transaction is, is, is committed, um, the SQL argument session kind of assumes, it kind of behaves as though the database acts in what we call serializable isolation, which it usually doesn't, but it, it, it kind of is built around this, this ideal that, well, if in the absence of the user telling us to refresh things, we're gonna assume that everything in this transaction is basically not changing. But once the transaction is over, okay, we have we know nothing now. We need to get it all back again. Um, and you, for many years, this this feature of auto, of expiring commit, I would I would have thought was crazy. Um, but you know, we had people say, oh, I you know, I just commit. I have concurrent stuff happening, and I got my and my data is stale. And it did the wrong thing, and people <clears throat> kind of you know not not everybody, but a lot of people kind of expected it to to know about this. So that was why the expiring commit model was added, just so it's there. Um, if you're running a web application and you have your web request do a bunch of stuff and then do a commit, and then you send all your objects off to like a template to be rendered, turn off expire on commit. 
don't just leave it leave it off it's it's the most easy to set flag expire on commit it's only expire on commit is only if you're going to have a lot of transactions running with the same set of objects and you're worried about concurrent transactions affecting them uh that's the reason for that and which is really not the usual case it's, it's the most correct case but it does not always perform well to have all these extra queries. And also what you'll see is this thing called detached objects is that if the objects have expired and then they are no, and then you close your session and it's gone, the objects are in a state known as detached. And everyone who works at CCOGV will know that when you try to access unloaded attributes on detached, it throws an error because there's no transaction. Uh, and so, so anyway, expire and commit, it, you may or may not want it, just be aware of it. Okay. So rolling back changes, we're going to do some changes that we don't want just to show. We're going to change SpongeBob's username to the word spongy as a question. Let me do the question. Nah. So, OK, any thought of making the expire on commit default off? No, because I want the, de the, 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 the default behavior to be the most correct behavior possible. And then performance should be like the, like the performance of that should be opt, opt in because Usually people shouldn't really be working. Usually when you work with the ORM, you work with your objects, then you commit the transaction, then you're done. So this use case of, I want to keep the objects working after the session, whether de detached or not, you should, if you're going to do that programming pattern, you should opt into that programming pattern. Um, if I kept expiring to commit default off, nobody would ever know about it. Nobody would ever use it. And I'll get all the same bugs again, where people who expect it to work in that way. Um, you know, uh, the thing is, when expiring commit is on, and then people want to use detached objects, they get the error immediately. Oh, there's an error message here. This, so, like, it's loud. Uh, you want the default to be such that when people do the thing that's not supported, they get a loud problem. So, expiring commit default off is more prone to a silent kind of failure, whereas having it on is more prone to a loud kind of failure, if that makes sense. Um, and that's why we have the session maker. You just put it off. If you don't want it, put it off. But like you should know about it because it's. You, I, I actually use it for things. It depends on what you're doing. You know, if you're doing a low scale thing, you want to make sure everything is correct with concurrency, keep it on. You know, you find that not, that not that many queries are actually running if you're, you know, if you're just querying everything fresh in your transaction. You know, it's not, it's not always that big a deal. <clears throat> so in here, <clears throat> so we're going to make um, uh, some changes we don't like. We'll change SpongeBob username. We will make another user with a fake name. It's not valid. And they will add that to the session. Pending, uh, we'll run a query that will auto flush, that will ch change SpongeBob username to the wrong name, that will insert this row we don't like. We get them back. But these uh, rows, while they're quote unquote in the database, they're not actually in the database, meaning they're not uh, durable. They're only uh, within the scope of the transaction. If you go once your Postgres database and you shut it off, you'd lose this data because, um, depending on your your durability settings, uh, you know this this transaction would be lost, and it's not actually durably committed to the database yet. It's just uh, within the scope of the transaction, and most of our modern databases, not SQLite, maybe they do now, uh, use this thing called multi-version concurrency control, uh, which means that many transactions can all have different versions of the same row. Because well, I did this change, I did that change, and they're all going to see something different. And then when they all try to commit, it'll all like either lock or whatever. But the point is that there's kind of a, a kind of a shadow copy of a row that's the, the pending version. Uh, so this the ORM session kind of tries to work with that model. So we have data we don't like in our database, but it's not persistent yet. So if we roll it back. Uh, that will roll back the transaction. The, the, the database no longer has that data. Those changes we just made, the update and the insert are gone. Um, the session itself will, again, do this expire thing. Uh, it will expire everything. Uh, and then when we go to spongebob.username again, oh, it's expired. Let's begin a new transaction and get the state of the world again. Reload it, and then we see that spongebob's username is back to the name spongebob. And then also, when we did the rollback, any objects that were pending as of that transaction, like that fake user we created, they will be evicted from the session when a rollback occurs. So pending objects, objects that were pending to persistent will be evicted upon rollback. That's the rule. What it really means is that it just does the thing you expect, <laughs> which is that the, the fake user is not in the session anymore. Uh, just in case I didn't show the SpongeBob, 
is in a session. So the, all the objects that are in, you, you can use contains with session to see an object in session or not. All right, so, so okay. And the data is obviously gone from the database. So you query the database, you get to spec the one row with the correct name. Okay. Now we're gonna do ORM querying, which we saw a little bit, of, we saw a little bit of this a minute ago. We saw that the select object is now used with session execute which is awesome. Um, so back like for the SQL expression chapter, we'll notice that the attributes that are on the user class, so this is where uh, SQL and ORM mapped classes are not really like Python data classes. Um, we map these attributes that will be persisted on instances of user, but it also applies what's called a Python descriptor to the class, which also provides behavior at the class level. So this is not a user object, this is the user class. And we can look at user dot username, and we actually get an object that is kind of like a column. Uh, it's actually called instrumented attribute, and it's a descriptor that has all those same EQ, any, all those overridden Python magic methods. So while the user does have a table in it, and we could say username equals like that, and we can print that, you know, we could do that. We can also do it from the point of view of the user class. And actually, there actually is a difference between these two things that you can't really see that tends to work itself out is that when you do a user, uh, that username expression, there's actually some secret stuff inside that you don't need to know about, but it's there. Well, it's not there. <laughs> user, anyway. Forget I tried that because I, I just didn't do the right thing. <laughs> There's supposed to be some annotations that refer to the expression. It, it, it's sexy in the username column. Um, the user, the, when you make an <clears throat> expression with the class, there's actually some special annotations that are buried inside of there <clears throat> that have it know that this is an ORM expression and not the uh, not the the core. So the the select object knows to behave a little bit differently in some cases even though my example of my own code failed miserably because I forgot how it works. So moving on, <laughs> we can take that expression and we're going to make a new query and we're going to say query equals select user, the user class, not the table, the class, where the user class's username attribute is SpongeBob. I'm going to order by the user class's ID attribute, which as we said before, have column-like things and behaviors. So that query is a is a regular course select. Now this probably know will work. Here's, a, here's another me looking at my own code live to see if I know what I'm doing. There you go. The query inside in the internals has the table object. All right, one more try for annotations. Annotations. There it is. Ha ha. <laughs> There's the magic ORM stuff. So you don't need to know that this is just me picking up my own code, just quizzing myself on how I. This, this is the magic of a live event. Yeah, I'm just quizzing myself for no reason. You know, this is internal. You don't need to know this. But anyway, this is how this is how the magic. This is how the sausage is made, right? It's like you did select user, and it, it went. Oh, let me get the table out of there, and let me have a table with all this magic. Oh, this is actually a map table. So it's all inverse. But doesn't matter. This is the part you need to worry about. <laughs> Sorry about that other part. Okay, so we can execute this select statement and we get back a result object, the same one we get in core, and we can iterate the result raw object and we get back rows. And by rows, we mean the row, which is a tuple. Uh, we don't get back user objects, we get back tuples with uh, of rows with the user object is the first cool. column in the thing. So you see the, the same old query we've done about 100 times now. And you get back, if you look carefully, this is a tuple. So it's, it's a, the parentheses and the comma. So it's a row. Um, and this is also new in 2.0 is that we just decided this has to be explicit because in, 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 in query all the people that know the ORM, the dot all method would be like objects or would it return rows? It was this or that, it was inconsistent because we were worried that people didn't want to type out the words to get the, the scalars back, but it's, it, it just had to change because people are, it's too inconsistent the way it was. <clears throat> Starting to lose my voice, but we'll make it. Um, as it's typically convenient for rows that only have a single element, you can say result that scalars 
and then you get back uh, the individual user objects instead of the rows. So usually when you want to iterate the ORM result that has just one class in it, you say for object and result that scalars, and then you get back the, the class by itself, and then you're good. Someone has some evil microphone thing happening. Okay, it's over. That wasn't me, right? Okay. Um, you can also qualify the rows, like you do the one thing where you want to get just, just one row back. You know, so uh, one, one, well, here, result at scalars means give me scalar results and then give me just the dot one. So you can do that. So the result now has this method chaining thing going on too, where you can modify the results and then call accessors on it. Um, and you can also query for individual uh, columns, just like the regular select always does. And then you get back a row uh, for row result and printing out the two elements of the row. So it's, it's you know, printing here. So you get back the, the tuple based rows with the individual columns. You can combine entities and columns together. Uh, here's the user object with the user name. Uh, and then it's printing out row.user. So here's how you get the, the name tuple. If your name of your class is user, the row will have row.user, row.user, row.user name. There's some, just some access mechanics there. <clears throat> you can use the, for the where clause, you can use filter by, which also works in core now. You can use filter by with core queries too against the table. Uh, filter by is a quick one for just key equals value. You can use uh, where as before for more uh, complicated uh, SQL criteria, just like core, it's exactly the same. Like, I, I don't have to teach you this again. I already taught it to you in the core chapter. And that's, and that's the end of the basic. So the, the SQL queries look exactly like core queries and they run, they do the right thing. That's the first part of ORM. And we can go to the next part, which is the hard part. Okay. See, previously I had a whole, a whole explanation for query, it's session.query, it's different. It does this, it does, it works, it's different. Now it's, now it's the same, it makes it, my job easier. Yeah, it feels way more natural yeah. that way. This is because when query came out, I it, it kind of happened by accident. It just kind of like some someone contributed something and like, oh, that's cool, let's do that. It just kind of became this casual thing. And that's what we could do. And, and I didn't know query was gonna be so fancy. It just became really fancy. And I realized slowly, hey, this thing is really supposed to be just like select, okay. And then for years, I'm like, how can I join them together? Cause it's so dumb looking now. Finally, okay. Anyway, advanced ORM. Uh, where we're now going to work with two tables and joins and subqueries and eager loading. Um, so we have the same user mapping. We have the registry like we did before. We map a user class and now we're going to add this new thing to it called addresses, it's, which will be a one to many collection <clears throat> to um, this other class that we can just name by a string called address. Um, we haven't declared the address class yet. So we just call it by a string. A uh, relationship means on a mapped class, this map class will be referring to some other kind of map class. So if you look at the map classes as a, as a graph, the relationships are the edges of the graph. The, if the map classes are the nodes, relationships are the edges. Um, and then we're also gonna add this thing called back populate equals user, which means that as we manipulate this addresses list of addresses, uh, it should also manipulate a dot user attribute on the address class that we haven't even made yet, but you'll see it. So here's the address class, where again, like in core, we have a column with a foreign key. And I probably forgot to note this before. <clears throat> when you do have a column with a foreign key, we can omit not only the name, but also the data type, because the data type of a foreign key, of a column with foreign key is assumed, as it probably has to be, to be the same type as the, refer, as the referred column, which is uh, integer in this case. So we put the foreign key separately notice, and then we also put this relationship. So even though the th thing is that this relationship refers now to a, a many to one relationship where address.user is many to one, meaning many addresses can refer to one user. And that's because many rows in the address table can refer to the same user account ID column. Um, the, 
the part of SQL Alchemy that we call the core is this part with the foreign key in the column. And the part of SQL Alchemy that we call the, the ORM is relationship. Those two things are separate uh, because we want you to know about your schema. We don't want the relationship to just automatically decide what kinds of columns you want or anything. And you'll notice that because we make the foreign key explicit, we don't actually have to say many to one or one to many. We just say relationship. Because the, the many to one or one to many or, or many to many is, is determined based on what is apparent. It's, in, it's, in, it's inferred from the foreign key relationships. Uh, and as people that know SQL can to test that if your foreign key relationships aren't set up correctly, it will help you to do that. Um, we don't want to lock you into a simplistic foreign key primary key setup. There are ways to make relationships that join on very elaborate criteria. Uh, so we want that to be open and you can do what you want with it. Um, so to work with these a little bit, let's make our database. Again, DDL, the two tables that we've seen in the SQL advanced chapter. Calvin just changed to a picture of that. Okay, that's a, that's a flat picture. Um, we can add some data like we did before, add the three user objects. And we can, uh, so also another thing I'm showing here, uh, we made the session maker with the bind of the engine and the future equals true. When you make a session maker in one bot four, you can use the session maker as a transactional context manager, which I would recommend. Um, so you have this session maker and you say with session maker dot begin as session. So it's going to give you this session. It will do things with it. And then at the end, it will commit it. And this is basically analogous to the engine level, engine.begin. Um, so that's another way in which 1.4 is trying to make session ORM and core more consistent is that the session maker is analogous to the core engine. And the session itself is analogous to the core connection. I mean, it, there's some differences, but anyway. So we add these rows. And the new user object that we made gains an empty addresses collection based on the relationship and we're gonna populate the collection with some address objects. So we have this Squidward object and we're going to assign a Python list to it of address objects. Uh, and when we do that, uh, SQL Alchemy ORM, because we did this thing called back populates, is like, okay, user.addresses collection, each of those address objects should have a dot user pointing back to the user. So we could say Squidward, Give me your addresses. Give me the number one element of your address list. OK, here it is. OK, of that element, what is dot user? Oh, it points back to Squidward. It's a bidirectional relationship. Um, and these are very common in SQL Alchemy because when you have the, the database foreign key, you have one row and then the other row with the foreign key. You can refer both. You know, this, It's not like it's one direction or the other. It's, it's both ways based on relational math. So. Um, you can set these up in your relationship, which is pretty con not not required. You don't have you can have just one direction, but usually people are setting up both sides. It's pretty it's pretty much the norm. And so when you do that, it will it will cross synchronize in memory alone. Again, this this addresses thing has not happened to the database. The database doesn't have any address rows in it yet. Um, when we add this new object Squidward to the session, uh, a thing happens again. The, the term is from Hibernate called cascade which means that, okay, Squidward is coming to the session. Okay, let me also get everything Squidward is related to and put that in the session also. So it's going to cascade Squidward plus Squidward's three address objects are all pending in the session. So it just saved us some time. We could have said session dot add all Squidward and Squidward's addresses, but it, you know, it, the, 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 the default behavior is to cascade them in. I see a question. Yeah. You know, there had to be some, what is Hibernate? So, you know, <laughs> Hibernate is the very everyone, famous- Everyone has, everyone has influences. <laughs> yeah. Hibernate is the very famous ORM for Java that, because Java was kind of still coming online itself. You know, Hibernate is very complicated. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy, but I had to look and see what they did. And I took a lot from Hibernate. Um, but the fact that Python's a dynamic language made doing the things that Hibernate does a lot easier and more succinct. Um, I actually did work with Hibernate a lot. I work with XML mappings. I work with Spring. I've seen all kinds of things. Um, <laughs> it's 
all the jokes are coming. Okay. Anyway, everything's everything is uh is cascaded in. I'm a sucker for jokes. I'm oh, it is, yeah, it's from Java. Yeah, hibernate hibernate's from Java. Yeah, I thought everyone knew that. See, God, that's how old I am. I don't recommend getting old. It's kind of difficult. You know, you know things that no one else knows because it's old. And then when you say you know it, people are like, wow, you're old. Um, commit. We know what that'll do. That'll push everything in. Um, and what's nice here, one of the jobs that SQL Alchemy ORM does that is a pain in the butt to do manually is it inserted the user account row with just username, full name. It had to ask SQLite, hey, SQLite, what's the primary key for that new row? Oh, it's number one, but actually number four in this case. Okay, let me take that primary key number four back. I've got these addresses to put in now. Let's put those in also. And they have user ID number four. Now, two things had to happen for this to work correctly. The unit of work had to know that the user class goes in first so that we can get the new primary key. And we know that the addresses are dependent on the primary on the user. So we get the new primary key back, and then it has to know to populate that new primary key into the rows into the foreign key of the rows we're going to put in. So this is what the unit of work does is if you had a if you had a data uh, active record thing and you had user.save, address.save, address.save. If you did address that save first, it would break because user ID would be null. Um, so the unit of work takes care of that kind of thing. And I don't really know why people would not want to use a unit of work that is doing these things for you, like reconciling whose foreign key points to what. Well, who wants to deal with that? It's it's like again, just write SQL. Yeah, but this is just boring. <laughs> if you do it 10,000 times, it's just boring. Let's automate it. I know what a foreign key is. I know what a primary, I know what auto increment to primary key is. I don't not know those things. I just want to automate the thing so I can get back to coding. Um, so Squidward has now been uh, expired. And again, this is that expire on commit thing. We did the commit and it expired. Here's another advantage of expire on commit is that after the transaction, well, now squidwords.addresses collection should load. And this is called, a, again, called a lazy load, where Squidward is going to both refresh his, his primary key and internal stuff. And we're also going to get the collection of addresses associated. So when we say squidward.addresses, you get those three address objects, lazy loaded by default. And of course, there's a whole subject called eager loading that we'll cover if I don't run out of time. Um, and that collection is persistent in memory until the transaction ends. So uh, if we load squidward.addresses again, it's, it's, it's there. It's not going to make a, a, the query twice. There's an option to make it do that, but it's not as common. So when we want to work with uh, collections and references, um, we don't really want to work with the foreign key. We, we don't want to say you know, address.userid equals 5. You, you can. You're allowed, you're allowed to set that. But the normal SQL Alchemy way is that you manipulate the references of objects to each other. And the foreign keys will be uh, synchronized by the unit of work as update, statement happens, up, up, as update statements happen. So in this example, we want to get SpongeBob. And then we want to take uh, one of the addresses from Squidward. Anyone who's watched SpongeBob SquarePants knows the, the pattern that SpongeBob is constantly messing with Squidward. Um, take one of Squidward's addresses and say dot user is SpongeBob. So Squidward's dot addresses collection has three addresses. We're going to say one of them dot user is now SpongeBob. So when we do that, we just see some select because nothing because again everything is pending, nothing has happened. Um, by assigning dot user on one of Squidward's email addresses, the object moved from one addresses collection to the other. This is the back populate future work. So now, if you look at Squidward dot addresses, the uh, address object that we touched has been removed from his list in memory. Uh, and SpongeBob now has that address. So by manipulating dot user, the many to one side, the one to many side was updated for us in memory. That usually works in memory without having to uh, flush anything. Commit all that. And we see the end result is an update statement where it's going to change the foreign key column on email address to refer from uh, to, uh, no, 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 to refer the, the email address to whose ID number two to refer to SpongeBob's user ID, which is one. So now it's been moved in the database. So that's basic relationship persistence. 
Now we're going to do relationship selecting. This is where we see joins again. So all the same issues with joining and Cartesian products works exactly the same way with ORM stuff. You have a select. And before we fed it the user table and the address table or a column from those, now we can feed it the user class and the address class. And we can just do a, 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 an implicit join in the where clause. And we can get rows back. And what will the rows be here? They will be a tuple with a user and address object in each row. So we get that back. And we have tuples, which are the three rows that we have. Uh, so we get a Squidward twice because there are two addresses that refer to Squidward and we get one for SpongeBob. So that's pretty cool. Um, just like with the uh, core, you can say select user address or whatever you want dot join address and it will join on the foreign keys from user to address. So you get the same results, but uh, I didn't print them the same way. Uh, join like that. And you can do that. You can do join. Okay, so if you want to give it an explicit SQL expression for the on clause, you can uh, set the on clause as the second argument. This is again the same exact select we've already illustrated. Uh, and then another way to join, we can also use dot join from, which I didn't illustrate here, but join from works. You could say select user, comma address, or select user dot join from user, comma address. That works too. Everything works the same. If it doesn't work the same, it's a bug. You can report it to me. Um, so here is one more way to join that only is in the ORM, which is because in the ORM, we have, again, this class bound attribute called addresses. So the when you send to the select, this is the core select, select, and you say dot join, and then you pass it the user dot addresses relationship at the class level, it will know what to do with that because when we run this statement through the session, there's actually a compiler uh, extension that gets enabled for this statement. Um, and the statement itself, uh, the compiler extension is, is part of the statement. So if you print it out here, so this is the core, if people who have worked with SQL Argument before and know this would know this is very weird. This we could never do this before, that we have a core select with a join against a relationship and it did the join using an ORM join. And that's because the, the new architecture has this whole new thing where the fact that we selected from ORM entities, a whole new compiler extension was brought in behind the scenes to actually interpret things like user addresses in terms of the ORM. Um, if this doesn't make any sense to you, all you need to know is if you want to join two classes, you can say join user addresses, which is fairly intuitive. Um, so, and that's, that's it. That's joining. It's, that's the whole thing. You know, we've already gone through it. Um, so here's the same example with alias. So, um, user, our user defined class is not a table. So before we had like user table dot alias, SQL Alchemy doesn't want to attach any extra methods on your class because it's your class. We don't want to step on your names at all. You know, maybe we don't step on your names at all. Um, so if you want to make an alias of of uh, what we call an ORM entity, like the user or address classes, there's a function in ORM called alias, and you run the alias function on the outside of it, and that will create an alias object, very much like the one we had in core, except it is uh, a little more ORM enabled. It has the relationships on it, it has all the other stuff. So this is the same query that we did in the core chapter in terms of ORM records. So it's the same SQL, uh, select from the user, join from user to address alias one, join from user to address alias two, put some where criteria for each, each alias separately. Uh, and this query here is mostly, if not completely identical to the one that we had in the core chapter. Um, so when you read the 1.4 2.0 tutorial, it will, do, it will teach you about select statements just once because 99.9% .9 of what you learn about selects for core are exactly the same in ORM except for the Really, the only thing is this joining on the relationship thing is the only thing that's different. Um, and another little modifier, if you want to join using a relationship, but the target of the join is an alias or not the normal thing that user addresses points to, there's a modifier, this is also in 1.3, of type. So usually when you say select user, join to user addresses, 
That means join from user to address. What if we want to join from user to the address alias, but we want to use this relationship to tell us how to join it? That's fine. Uh, we just say dot of type, and it'll adapt that join to be against the 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 alias version. Um, a reason we might want to be using join user addresses because we might have relationships in our classes that have all kinds of special conditions coded at the class level. You can have uh, relationships that will query for objects that are all as of a certain date or all have a certain criteria or they all have like a deleted flag or something set. 15 minute warning. Yep. I'm doing really well. Look at the like 21. I'm on slide 21. It's like, like, like it's like a SpaceX landing on the platform, right? <laughs> Um, again, this is that same, not quite the same query. This is a query with uh, subqueries and joins. Um, just like before, nothing changes. Uh, select uh, count of addresses and user ID, group by user ID and do a subquery. This is the exact same syntax. We literally could use the tables here if we want, it doesn't matter. And then um, we can select from uh, username and then the func coalesce, and then we will do an outer join here. Uh, to the sub queue, and we're actually doing this the the on clause explicitly, which we don't actually don't have to. It'll do the automatic thing, but it's okay, and we can get the subquery back. And CTEs work the same way too. Uh, so basically, everything we did in core is already good for the ORM. And I think the next section should be eager loading. Yep. Eager loading. So <clears throat> the uh, biggest the most famous issue of ORMs is called the N plus one problem. And when I tried to explain it last time I did this talk, I got confused. So let me see if I can do it. The N plus one problem is if you select 10 objects and each of those objects is related to some other object, and then you go to those objects and you want to access the additional object and it uses lazy loading, you will get N plus one query. So the N is 10, you have 10 rows. You'll get a query for the 10 rows in the first place. And then for each, each of those 10, you get a second query. So that's n plus one query. So what that looks like is this, a lot of queries. So we basically went through a bunch of user objects and then we printed the user addresses collection and we got n plus one queries. Um, so instead we can do eager loading, uh, which means we can apply options to the, So eager loading means that we have to tell the query about our intent for what related things we want to load also up front. So eager loading by nature requires some pre-planning. We know that we want to load all these user objects and we know that we want to get all the addresses from them, um, which is a collection. The best eager loader these days, if it's compatible to use, is called select and load. Uh, select and load will emit a second query that uses an in against the primary keys of all the, the primary rows that it, that it loaded. Um, so we take the same query, we write it the same way, we add this extra call called options, and options are where we put loader options. They're always special modifiers that are handled by the ORM. Core does not have the notion of options. The core, core has the options method, but it doesn't have any effect with core. With the ORM, it knows you want to select and load these, uh, these, uh, these address objects. Select and load itself is a function that we import from the ORM namespace. So this is otherwise the same query that we just saw emit a lot of n plus one queries. So now when we run it, we see just two queries. Um, the first query is the user account. The second query is going to take all the user IDs here and put them in an in clause here. And that way it loads all the collections at once. And the reason this is very efficient is because it does not use outer joins, which are not good for query planners. It does not emit any queries for rows that we didn't find. Like if we had user accounts, you know, like left out, if, if a, it doesn't equip extra queries, uh, I'm getting confused. Um, also, it produces a select statement that, that normally does not involve any other tables. It doesn't have any joins in it. Uh, and especially MySQL is, has a lot of trouble with joins. So the select and load tries to make a query in as many cases as possible that has no joins or subqueries in it at all. It does a straight in lookup, which will use the indexes uh, that are on the user ID uh, foreign key. So it's very fast from a single point of view. Um, okay. 
So the oldest loading strategy is called join load. And this does a left outer join or an inner join based on what you say uh, to the related row. Um, and it works for collections, uh, but it's usually better for many to ones because with the many to one, you're getting the rows back and each of your primary row will have only one entry for the related object because it's many to one. Uh, that way you're not getting lots of Cartesian rows for each co collection element. So uh, join load uh, has a uh, optical inner join. So we're going to load address objects and tell it to inner join load the user at the same time. So you see a nice inner join. And when we print address object dot user that username, there's no extra query emitted. Um, the Zen of instant, uh, the Zen of eager loading refers to the fact that eager loading does not want to ever change the result that you get back. Eager loading is only about population of collections and attributes eagerly. Um, if you want to write a query with a join and you want to join because you want to actually join to this other table and, and filter on the table, you don't use join load for that. You use dot join for that. Join load is always going to keep its work away from you. You can't actually get to the SQL that join load emits because it's, it's going to alias it with anonymous names. If, so if you want to join from address to user, you should join from address to user. Um, a problem arises when you want to select from address, join to the user table, you want to filter on the user table, but you also want to eager load it. That's a third problem that happens. So we, have, we have collection eager loading, we have many to one eager loading, and then we have many to one eager loading where I also want to join. Okay, what do we do here? Um, well, if we say join load, we'll get something that we don't want. It, it'll work fine, but it's not as efficient as we want. It'll get, it'll be um, joining. Let me move the little window up here. It will select from email address table, join to user account. And then it also is going to additionally join to it again with a left header join, which is not as efficient because we didn't put inner join equals true here. So it's joining to user account twice uh, so that I can get this thing. And that is wasteful. Um, this is not automatically handled. Uh, if you want to handle this case, you do another loader option that you should know about called contains eager. <clears throat> contains eager means I want to eagerly load something, but I already wrote the query for it. You just get it for me. You figure it out. You figure out where it is, and I'll, and I'll get it. So what we did here is we said, OK, select from address, join to address user, filter on the username of Squidward, and then also assign that for me, please. As you get those user rows, add those columns for user to the to the to the from to the select statement and put them in for me. So we'll notice if we were to select from address and join to the user table, you would see in the select in the columns clause, select you know ID name, ID email address from email address. You wouldn't see the columns for the user table. But because we said contains eager, oh, Let's get those two and also stick them onto the user, onto the address object. So when you run this, you'll see, I have to move my little box again. You'll see the user account columns are here and the email address columns are here and the join is there and it loads everything all at once using contains eager. So contains eager um, is used when you have a join load that you want to do, but you're also joining. And it's kind of a, more specific thing. It's it's kind of interesting that I even have it in this talk. It's, it's kind of more of a detail thing. Uh, but anyway, that's the, the eager loading story is uh, for collections. Uh, select and load is pretty much the best one if it works. Because sometimes the reason select and load is not always compatible is because if you have composite primary keys, when it does the in lookup for the uh, the, the parent object, it has to use uh, a tuple uh, within. And not every database supports tuples like I think Oracle or maybe SQL Server doesn't support it. Yeah, they, most databases support it. For a while, SQLite did not support it, now they do. Um, so select and load might have problems with composite primary keys, but not too much. Um, so select and load is very good for collections and joined load is good for many to ones. Um, and there's a whole lot of other, of other things that go along, go along with how many to ones and collections are loaded, um, but it's in the docs because <laughs> we have so much time. And that's probably the last slide for that. Okay.